but really wanted to welcome everybody. I don't know where I got cut off, but it, you know, it's good, great to get everybody back together again. And we wanted to revitalize our urology sort of postgraduate education um, to bring our community back together. And, you know, we've been, you know, looking at the list of people who are here. Uh, it's good to see a lot of familiar uh, friends and colleagues here. And let me just sh share my screen. Um, great. Is that working now? Um, and I think, again, I, I wanted to just highlight, you know, uh, Lindsay Hampson's work in establishing the COVID lecture series, which started uh, almost a year ago. And, you know, there's a link to the library of recorded talks by, you know, a great group of uh, educators. And there have been 126 lectures over this last one year alone. Uh, in addition to COVID, you know, there, there's been a lot of positive change and evolution for our department. And, you know, we've transitioned from the uh, excellent leadership of Dr. Peter Carroll for 25 uh, years and uh, Dr. Raj Pruthi is the new chair of our Department of Urology, who's arrived during a challenging time, but just in over this year, he's done a great job shepherding the department, getting us through, uh, you know, the ups and downs of uh, what we've had to deal with. And Raj will talk a little bit later this morning. Um, also, we've added three new outstanding colleagues to our department. Uh, Dr. David Bain, uh, who was a resident here at UCSF, did his fellowship with Tom Chi and Marshall Stoller. And his area of expertise is endourology and minimally invasive surgery for the benign realm. Also, we're really fortunate to have uh, Michelle Van Kuyken come and join us and uh, join with Ann Seskind to help support our uh, female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery uh, uh, division. Um, she trained at Loyola, did her fellowship uh, in um, FPMRS down at UCLA. And then finally, uh, Dr. Sam Washington, who was uh, not only a resident and fellow here, but also a medical student here at UCSF. So he's maybe been here longer than almost everybody else, uh, who's joined our division of urologic oncology, really covering a variety and the whole spectrum of urologic oncology. And his uh, area of research focus on as health disparities in urologic oncology. So welcome to uh, Raj as the new chair and our new three new faculty members who are really going to augment our our group. Uh, and before we start, just a few housekeeping items. If everybody at the end could fill out the evaluation survey, obviously there are uh, free CME credits available for attending this. Uh, and uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, Kirstie and I will try to uh, manage that. We didn't build in a lot of break time or there are no break times, so bio breaks you can do on your own. But we'll try to answer one or two pressing questions probably at the end of every lecture. But that's why we had the breakout sessions that'll start at 11.15 after the talks end, where the faculty will be there and then additional questions and challenging cases can be discussed and answered. And even if you didn't um, sign up for the breakout sessions ahead at the end at 11.15, then you can, Kirstie will have an option where you can uh, select which breakout room you'd like to go to. And any question, any issues during this, if you need to sort of get in touch with me directly, that is my email address there. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Annabelle Adisho for the first talk on uh, small renal masses. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining. And uh, Kirsty, if you can enable screen sharing for me, so I can bring up my slides. All done. Excellent, thank you. So thank you all for joining us on this uh, early uh, uh, Saturday morning. Um, today we'll get started by talking about uh, how we think about and approach the small renal mass. We often call it a, a morass um, because imaging management um, can be a challenge in select patients. Now, there was an increased incidence in identification of small renal masses up until kind of the 2008, 2010 range, and then that seems to have plateaued a little bit. Um, but we see, even though we're finding so many of these renal masses, the overall mortality from RCC is not significantly decreasing, not commensurate with what we're identifying. And this is data from SEER. So that leads us to wonder, are we finding things that maybe weren't going to be a problem? And this leads us to think a lot about the prostate cancer paradigm. Uh, 
and this is a slide from Dr. Carroll where he discusses, you know, historically we would try to identify all prostate cancers and treat them all uh, with heavy and repeated screening and no deferred treatment. We transitioned into the world of active surveillance where there was still initially heavy screening, but we offered surveillance to low risk patients. And now we're really trying to avoid the detection of low risk disease and then offer surveillance to those uh, in which we do find it. Is that something that'll be possible with kidney cancer? Well, there is no screening for kidney cancer, but as we know, a lot of these masses are found incidentally, and oftentimes that's not in our control. So here you can see a really significant increase in imaging, both uh, cross section um, ultrasound <coughs> and uh, CT. And this is the use of imaging per uh, thousand Medicare enrollees uh, up to 2012 is the most recent data that I found. And uh, it's increasing across uh, outpatient um, environments, the emergency department. Um, and so it's pretty, pretty significant. I don't think we'll have a huge impact on the ability to stop the detection of incidental masses. So we're gonna be faced with that. How do we determine what to do? Um, AOA guidelines were most recently updated in 2017. And for clinical T1A renal masses, the guidelines recommend prioritization of partial nephrectomy for management when intervention is indicated, right? So not that every uh, small renal mass should get intervention. Um, and to really prioritize an nephron sparing approach if you have some uh, pressing indication, um, and then also for young patients with multifocal masses. So let's talk about imaging. <clears throat> We're all quite comfortable with uh, traditional imaging, uh, CT, MRI, uh, ultrasound. Can we try to get some additional information once we have a mass that may not be of uh, clear etiology uh, or we'd better want to better risk stratify. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, some contrast enhanced ultrasound uh, here at UCSF, and I think it's becoming more uh, widely available. Now it's non-toxic, it's not traditional iodinated contrast. Uh, there are micro bubbles enclosed in a lipid or protein polymer shell, uh, similar to when someone's getting an echo with a bubble study. Um, there's a lot of inner observer variability and it, you need a uh, uh, qualified or high-skilled ultrasonographer because the contrast of the microbubbles <clears throat> don't persist very long. So the timing, uh, you know, the study has to be performed pretty efficiently. Um, now, compared to an ultrasound for cystic lesions, studies have shown upgrading um, and a high sensitivity, but a potentially also higher false positive rate. And here on the right, we can see for the contrast enhanced ultrasound, um, there's actually pretty poor iterator observability uh, between these providers. You can see CT is about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 consistently. You know, one and two agreed quite well, two and three not so much, and one and three was terrible. So I think this um, contrast enhanced ultrasound is promising, um, but mostly in a setting with high volume um, and more comfortable ultrasonographers. Now, do we have any imaging uh, advances for solid lesions? We know traditional FDG PET's not great, relatively low sensitivity. 11-choline um, uh, acetate studies, uh, some early promising studies, but you require, has a short half-life and you require an on-site synchrotron, so that's not widely available. And there have been some additional studies, for example, genotuximab, and I think this is not likely to happen. There's a, a phase three trial that was withdrawn and an Australian phase three trial that's underway. So I think, you know, really in terms of getting better imaging, um, one thing that we consider a little bit more often is now the cystic maybe scan. And this can help differentiate between oncocytoma slash hybrid oncocytic chromophobe from RCC. And this is an early study from the Hopkins group um, showing that there's increased relative uptake in the oncocytoma or hybrid oncocytic uh, chromophobes compared to an RCC or AML. And there's a, you know, the, the data is relatively young. There's a, a review article so far uh, looking at four um, published studies with 117 total masses. So I realize those are quite small numbers, um, but comparing, uh, identifying renal oncocytoma versus other renal lesions in this study, uh, in this cohort of studies, sensitivity of 92% and specificity of 88%, which is quite reasonable. 
and a reasonable job of determining whether a mass is benign or malignant. So the Hopkins group uh, recently published um, a cost-effectiveness analysis study and trying to determine how you um, how you have the best, how you have the uh, save the most quality adjusted life years um, and managing a biopsy or a cestamibi. And in option one, uh, you'd get a biopsy in all patients with small renal masses. And in option two, you'd get a cestamibi in all renal masses. And then option three, um, you'd get a cestamibi in all patients and then biopsy if the cestamibi is positive. And so that had the highest likelihood of um, having an untreated malignant tumor and the highest likelihood of having an untreated benign tumor, which is uh, good. Um, we're not doing sesame movies so widely yet, um, particularly because of some of that uncertainty, but I think this paradigm where, where there's a small renal mass and it's uncertain uh, if it's a low grade and you're considering surveillance or oncocytoma, a sesame may be followed by a biopsy may be a reasonable approach. So let's talk about biopsy. Which patients would benefit from biopsy? And, you know, the, the best uh, aphorism I've heard from um, Alex Kudukov is um, uh, not, not in everybody, but some, not always, but sometimes. And guidelines uh, recommend consider a biopsy when there's suspicion, uh, when you're suspecting that the mass is hematologic, metastatic, inflammatory, or infectious. And that um, and that's metastatic from another site, and that follows our clinical um, clinical practice and what we're used to doing. The key is we wouldn't necessarily biopsy a patient if it's not going to change our management, right? So if we're planning on managing with surveillance regardless, or in a young, healthy patient who, you know, we're not going to consider a long period of surveillance. Um, and a multiple core biopsy is often preferred uh, over an FNA. This is the AUA um, um, algorithm for when to biopsy. And this just restates what we previously said. Again, it's a little bit of an overcomplicated diagram in the guidelines at the end of the day, if it's going to change your management, okay? Biopsies are relatively safe. Needle tract seeding rate, I think uh, this was historically thought to be a concern, but the needle tract seeding rate is less than 1%. We almost never see it. <clears throat> um, the overall nine diagnostic rate in published studies is about 14%. I think that's proportional to the size of the mass. So smaller masses have higher non-diagnostic rates. Um, but a repeat biopsy can lead to a uh, diagnosis in about 80% of those patients, and the false positive rate is low, so that's reassuring. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the, I wouldn't, um, we don't take grade concordance from a biopsy too seriously because it can, uh, the grade from biopsy, because it can be challenging to identify uh, grade based on the biopsy sample. Um, <clears throat> but in studies that have tried to assess this, there's reasonable grade concordance about 67% uh, overall, but really more in, uh, useful is about 87% grade concordance between high and low. Um, and overall, the biopsies tend to be 57, have 57% 57 sensitivity for the detection of high grade disease. Um, <clears throat> and the complication rates are relatively low. This is well tolerated, particularly if your IR colleagues are comfortable with this um, hematoma, and this is really a clinically significant hematoma. The rate of hematoma is probably much, much higher, um, but a clinically significant hematoma, about 5%, significant pain, 1% of patients, low rates of gross hematuria, pneumothorax, um, you know, obviously higher risk with an upper pole mass than lower, um, and really significant hemorrhage, 0.4%. Uh, now, what do we do when we wanna surveil these patients? Um, we love, you know, we're surgeons, we love surgery. Um, but really in the right patient. I always tell my patients, um, you know, a partial nephrectomy is one of my favorite things to do, but I hate doing it if it's uh, not necessary. So the first question patients ask is, is this mass going to grow and spread? And there isn't a lot of data looking at masses um, over time because surveillance is a relatively new paradigm for renal masses, but we know at tumor size at presentation in masses less than three centimeters, <clears throat> 
the rate of uh, metastasis at the time of presentation was about 0.2%. Uh, so that's really reassuring. When you get to three to four centimeters, 1.8%, even up to five centimeters, 2.3%. So relatively a uh, small proportion of patients with metastases. Um, and the primary predictor of risk of metastasis with renal masses is uh, mean tumor size. Okay. And um, <clears throat> The, you know, that the odds ratio, of, and this is for, I think, every increased centimeter in tumor size, uh, there's a relative risk of 2.8 for developing metastatic disease. But again, with these small renal masses, I think we're, uh, we're seeing much uh, lower, almost clinically insignificant rates. Um, <clears throat> Now, there are growing cohorts of uh, active surveillance patients. Um, one of the largest is a uh, Hopkins group, and we'll review that in a little bit more detail. Um, but overall, you can see most of these cohorts are between, you know, 30 to 200 patients. They generally tend to be older patients, um, you know, mean age of uh, late 60s up to the early 80s. Mean tumor size in this two centimeter range rarely um, uh, above three centimeters. And patients always ask, how often does this tumor grow? Well, we see in general, I quote patients about 0.3 centimeters per year would be the expected growth rate. Uh, and you can see that in this cohort between you know, 0.1 to 0.3 centimeters. And these cohorts are relatively young. Some have significant follow-up, but this is a smallish cohort. So I think we're waiting, uh, waiting to see um, what the, uh, the long-term outcomes will be. Now, who's a candidate for surveillance? I think it's important to make sure we have, uh, just like in prostate cancer, make sure they're appropriately staged before you start surveillance. And that would be uh, high quality cross-sectional imaging. Ideally, candidates that have a limited life expectancy or multiple comorbidities. Um, you know, the, the key difference in paradigm between kidney cancer and prostate cancer surveillance is that we aren't dealing with a whole lot of quality of life outcomes in kidney cancer. Um, you know, uh, no issues, hopefully, with continence or um, uh, sexual function. And so when you have someone young with prostate cancer, it makes sense to put them on surveillance to try to delay the onset of those side effects um, of those quality of life related impacts. But for kidney cancer, if you have a 45 year old patient with a small renal mass, you know, as long as there's reasonable diagnostic accuracy, it, it's not going to make sense to watch this patient for 40 years. Um, you know, the optimal candidates for surveillance would be those that have stable tumors, uh, tumors that have, uh, tumors with no growth so far have not shown to have any uh, evidence of metastasis. Um, and um, there's some scoring systems that we could consider. Uh, this is the DISARM score, and this is published out of the Hopkins registry. It's a prospective surveillance registry. And they put this um, four item score together giving patients points for age. Uh, CCI is the Charleston Comorbidity Index. Um, and, you know, you don't necessarily, in your clinical practice, I, you wouldn't have to calculate this for every patient and go through and add up the scores. You can, you know, kind of pretty quickly reviewing their problem list if they have no significant comorbidities, just one or more than a few. Um, tumor diameter is an important predictive factor. And then the PCS, this is the uh, physical component score on the SF12. Um, again, you're probably not going to be administering the SF12 quality of life survey to all your patients, taking out the PCS score, sorry, and using that to determine if they're a candidate for surveillance. Um, but, you know, you can generalize to uh, high function versus low or uh, no one's looked at ECOG, but that could be a, a reasonable metric. And what we're seeing uh, here is the probability of overall survival for these patients. And it's not... Um, uh, overall survival from a uh, the traditional survival. In this figure, it's specific to uh, treatment-free survival. So did they end up needing some sort of treatment over time? Um, and this is just an overall summary of that intervention-free survival of this uh, similar cohort. So about 75% of the patients um, were able to make it to you know, about four or five years without needing a definitive intervention. And I think that's really reassuring. Um, you know, in our, and like I said, we, we love uh, doing surgery in the appropriate patient. 
But if we can find some of these patients, uh, and we have a growing cohort here at UCSF that don't need immediate treatment, uh, I think it's reasonable to watch them safely over time. Uh, our regimen, uh, again, making sure we have high quality cross-sectional imaging at the start, whether it's CT or MRI. And then I would follow up with an ultrasound every six months at first. And once we have a sense of what that progression is and what that mass is doing, um, then we can slowly start to space it out to every nine months. And if there's any suspicion uh, for change in size over time, then I would, that would trigger cross-sectional imaging to confirm. My trigger for action would be if the size broaches uh, three centimeters or the growth is over five millimeters per year. Um, and with that, I will uh, leave the last few minutes for any questions. Great job, Annabelle. I didn't see any questions pop up. Can I ask uh, one or two specific and then a broader question of you? Of course. So would you say number one, three centimeters is kind of your size cutoff of where you're under three, you're very comfortable watching. What do you quote as an annualized risk of metastasis in that sub three centimeter group? Yeah, so in, in so far in the cohorts that have been published, um, in masses that are less than three centimeters, there hasn't been any reported metastasis, um, but I, I would tell patients less than 1%. Yeah, and I think that's very reassuring from the, them to hear. I mean, I think that's the biggest concern of surveillance, right? If you kind of say it's probably 1% or year, less per year, when they hear that, I think that reassures a lot of them. They're like, oh, that's really low on an annualized rate. Um, and how about three to five centimeters? Because we do see a reasonable number of incidentally three to five. Are you inclined to treat? And which of those? It's kind of now our, you know, grade group two prostate. What are, what are you going to do about those? Yeah, I, I, I do have a few patients with three to five centimeter masses that we're watching. Um, it's a small number and it's really select group, really um, kind of another really pressing indication. So advanced age, additional comorbidities. And we have a, a much longer discussion that the rate of metastasis, you know, is in probably in that three to 5% range and it's not insignificant. Um, and so I would really only watch the watch those patients if there's a, a pressing indication. I have a, a 95 year old patient with a four and a half centimeter mass that we're watching closely. That she doesn't want any surgery. She realizes that there may be a risk of spread, um, but a, you know, a partial or radical in her may be challenging. Um, you know, and some other patients with significant other comorbidities or competing risks. And sort of final broader question: Do you think it's going to be five or ten years where we will have? tissue, because I don't think there's any serum or blood-based tests that'll help us. Do you think we'll have something in the near future that will be biopsy-based and we'll be biopsying everybody? Because I think GRADE is not necessarily a great surrogate, but do you think we'll have some molecular markers that we can look to to further guide who and when we need to intervene? Um, probably not in the five-year range. You know, when we look at some of the experience with metastatic disease and trying to identify biomarkers to predict uh, to identify the right treatment, even those uh, efforts have uh, not been wildly successful. And so um, I think it'll be uh, probably in that five to 10 year window before we have uh, a reasonable molecular um, uh, genetic uh, tools. <clears throat> Great. Well, thanks, Annabelle, for an excellent talk. And um, let's move on. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sam Washington. Uh, who will give some updates and some of the hot topics within prostate cancer. And really, you know, this represents, uh, you know, a huge effort led by Dr. Carroll for 30 plus years of, you know, now we look where active surveillance is, but it's not only that, it's a lot of the genomics that we know about for prostate cancer, you know, molecular imaging, and with Dr. Carroll, Dr. Shinohara, Matt Cooperberg, Hao Wen, but also our collaborators in pathology, you know, nuclear medicine, radiation oncology, and medical oncology. So Sam, why don't you fill us in? Great, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Samuel Washington, assistant professor in the department. Um, I'll go over the clinical application of genomics in PSMA PET and prostate cancer. And I'll just, uh, as a caveat, say that people are, you know, currently writing book chapters about all of this. So I'll kind of go over some key aspects. Uh, no disclosures for this presentation, and we'll kind of dive right in to where these two uh, imaging tests or testing 
uh, modalities in general are most helpful. And that's really in the clinical conundrum or that gray space of prostate cancer. So that's largely because we don't know the natural history of prostate cancer. It's too heterogeneous. But key domains are that we need to identify patients in terms of clinical risk who are more likely to progress quickly and also confirm those who would be ideal for active surveillance. And that's where genomic testing can come in and really help us if we're on the fence about some patients. In addition, when it comes to the accurate diagnostic uh, detection and staging of disease, thankfully we have a, a broader experience here with PSMA PET um, and hope that others will get it as well uh, as it was recently FDA approved. Now, let me just dive right into our tissue-based uh, gene expression testing. Here are a few examples. There are many others, and I'm not endorsing one over the others, um, but I can share a little bit about ways in which these are helpful, uh, the experience that we've had here at UCSF, and uh, a few different um, observations in the literature. Now, overall, we know that the genetic landscape for prostate cancer is incredibly heterogeneous. We know that even amongst those with low risk disease, using multiple different genomic classifiers, both commercial and non-commercial, we see a wide variation in the genomic signals, the clinical outcomes, and uh, presentation, which is quite interesting. Um, so it kind of tells us that relying on pathology, Gleason grade alone, we may be missing some important uh, prognostic uh, data. Now, NCSC and guidelines, both for low risk and intermediate risk, have started to endorse uh, the use of molecular tumor analyses, particularly in those men where we are considering active surveillance. Here are a few different tests um, that will kind of commonly pop up when we think of genomic classifiers. Again, mostly in men who have low or favorable intermediate risk disease, but I think the important thing to highlight here is that these have prognostic value. None of these tests are predictive. And that truly reflects the studies in which they were explored. So current clinical trials are looking at the predictive value. So if I have a decipher score of X, how often will I, does this mean that I will have a poor outcome or a uh, better response to radiation? Um, as opposed to studies that have been retrospective to date, showing that increased scores for any of these tests or the others are associated with worse outcomes. It's kind of a fine point but just hammering home the idea that none of these are crystal balls and will tell us exactly what happens in the future. Now, here's just a table, I'll leave this up. This is great, just a screenshot opportunity is what I thought when I first saw it. Um, and it just breaks down a few of our genomic classifiers, ones that we've used in our clinical practice. And you see that the uh, characteristics for, I'd say, patients who may be candidates change slightly between these. You see slight differences in terms of the uh, potential pathology seen on biopsy that may be amenable um, to use in these genomic tests, as well as turnaround time. One common thing that you see for all of them is that um, if it's prostate cancer is diagnosed uh, post-TERP, um, none of these tests are really acceptable for that, but you see variations in which tests could be used for patients who may have had uh, cryoablation before, as well as patients who may or may not be on 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Now, overall, there's always something when it comes to overlaying graphs, but uh, we see that the impact of these tests is legitimate, uh, meaning that when we integrate this into clinical practice, it gives us more information than we had from our clinical risk factors alone. The key that we see here that's uh, not coming across from this graph is that when we add our genomic uh, profile score, GPS score to our CAPRA, we see an increase in the uh, ability to predict, or in this case, technically prognosticate the risk of adverse pathology after prostatectomy. You can see here, every now and then it works. So uh, what we saw was that when we added our genomic classifier score to our CAPRA, nearly half had a 5% change or greater in the predicted risk of adverse pathology at time of prostatectomy. And we saw that that change was actually bi-directional. So a quarter had more favorable risk um, after the change, uh, as well as a quarter having less favorable. So it really helps us kind of in both directions, get people off of the fence or out of that gray space. Now we know when we look at GPS scores, for example, in the setting of active surveillance, 
when we look at biopsy cores that are positive um, at time of genomic testing, as well as an increase in the score itself, we see that a five-point increase in genomic score is associated with a 27% increased risk of upgrade to Gleason 3 plus 4, grade group 2 or greater on subsequent biopsy. So it is giving us information that is useful and it helps us better assess risk, but again, does, is not a crystal ball. Now, looking at genomic scores again in adverse pathology after delayed prostatectomy, we still see a similar pattern in terms of GPS providing information about the risk after prostatectomy in both terms of adverse pathology as well as PSA relapse after surgery. And we see again that that risk is not insignificant and we see that it's at least 10% in most groups. Now here this waterfall plot, uh, beautiful as it is, tells us that when we look across a large number of patients um, and we look at their outcomes, as well as their GPS scores, which is a y-axis. We see that those with higher GPS scores, you see a larger proportion of those in blue, those who experienced an upgrade uh, at three years after their genomic score was obtained. Now, almost as if they knew this course would happen, uh, European Urology actually presented and uh, posted a systematic review uh, for another genomic classifier, Decipher. Now this combined data from 42 studies and over 30,000 patients. And I'll just pull some key points or highlights uh, from this publication. Now, compiling all this data together, they saw that the, de the Decipher score it was independently associated with both adverse pathology, uh, biochemical recurrence, uh, disease, uh, and prostate cancer specific mortality. And that was consistent across all studies which used it. Now we see here, compared to the standard of care, how is Decipher, for example, performing? We see that this genomic classifier is not only improving the performance of standard of care, but also in and of itself providing vital information, similar to the prior slide. But again, this kind of reinforces the idea that genomic classifiers like Decipher or the others can provide useful information and help us, in some cases, change treatment to things that may be better suited for the patient and not accurately reflected by pathology slides alone. And this brings up the next question, can it change management? Now, in this systematic review of these studies, they saw that, yes, again, it was prognostic for long-term outcomes such as metastasis or survival. And yes, we did see observations in which it changed management. More importantly, the benefit from treatment differed by biomarker results. So these are all things that help us kind of fine tune and tailor treatment for the patient by introducing this genomic classifier as another risk factor rather than, again, not a crystal ball. Now, from this standpoint, let's move on to PSMA PET, um, a new exciting imaging modality that uh, thankfully we've had experience with here um, and is opening a lot of new opportunities. Now, PSMA, just as a broad kind of overview of what's going on with the imaging study, it's a transmembrane protein on the surface of prostate cancer cells. Now, being on the external aspect of the cells, it's an easy target for molecular binding. So this not only has implications for imaging in and of itself in terms of our PET scans, but also therapeutics. And I'll touch on um, some exciting things that are happening here at UCSF. Now, uh, gallium PSMA, ligand was really revolutionary. Um, and we have thankfully over the past few years um, been able to examine this closely in our own clinics um, and contribute to the data used um, that eventually led to the FDA approval that just happened um, for this. Now, we've been using this both in high-risk patients before treatment as well as at time of biochemical relapse. Now, again, what we're seeing here is that even compared to axiomen, on the left side, you're seeing that there are some areas that are hot on this PET scan, but within the same patient, you're seeing a lot more definition in terms of clarity, decreased ambiguity, um, and just larger burden that was underappreciated with other studies. Now, just bringing in our genomic classifiers, we see that even in the setting of genomic classifiers, we see there's a kind of synergy between these two. We see that higher genomic classifier scores were not only associated with pelvic nodal involvement identified on uh, PSMA PET, but also any PSMA PET avid uh, node um, genomic classifiers were known to be associated with these as well. 
Now, the role of PSMA PET in initial staging. So in patients with high-risk disease, we're seeing quite a bit of agreement. And what I mean by that is if you were to look at this two-by-two two table, basically the straight line going from the top left corner to the bottom right corner shows that the vast majority of patients in this cohort, there's agreement that if you see PSMA PET positive lymph nodes at time of imaging, there is a positive correlation or a positive finding of lymph nodes at time of surgical pathology. So here I want to bring up just a few images just to highlight um, the definition that we're seeing PSMA PET. And what this does is, despite the noise that you may see in the background, it really highlights specific areas where you may see a disease that may not be clear with other um, imaging modalities as well as different phases. Now, if we were to look at uh, fluciclovine compared to PSMA, both advanced imaging modalities um, and PET scans that we use, we're seeing again, PSMA PET is giving us a slightly different view, but with better clarity and identifying some areas that were not completely appreciated beforehand. And I just want to point to the arrows here. We don't need to zoom in too much on that. It's kind of obvious, but uh, we're seeing different spots that were not well characterized with our Axiom and PET scan. Now, again, I just want to bring home that this is a new technology, but exciting because of how much clarity and resolution that we're getting with these imaging studies. And we're seeing that um, compared to fluciclovine on the top, you're seeing much less background noise as well. So you're really honing in on those important areas. Uh, and as expected, you still see the kind of uptake within the bladder due to just the excretion and uh, clearance. But again, here highlighting this area around the prostate with minimal background noise in other areas, really honing in on the targets, noting that some of these targets are outside of our usual uh, lymph node uh, dissection templates that we use during most prostatectomies. Now, moving from kind of a pretreatment to post treatment space, we're seeing here that with typical scans, it's unclear, particularly in areas of bone what is going on? Is this a bone island? Is it prior trauma? And PSMA PET is giving us, again, an increased um, confidence in the likelihood that this is a area of disease. And again, as well as comparing CT, if we were using a CT abdomen pelvis, compared to PSMA PET scan, there are regions, again, outside of our typical templates for, say, lymph node dissection um, or examination that may be needing uh, further evaluation. Now in the setting of biochemical recurrence, we see that not only does the performance improve with PSMA PET um, as the PSA gets broader, but again, the background noise that we're seeing gets reduced as well. So here are two other kind of slides highlighting, again, lymph nodes that may not have been previously appreciated. And if you were to not use PSMA PET and other modalities, it's harder to distinguish these potential lymph nodes from other sites. Now, here's a, another interesting example for PSMA PET. Um, this is a patient who has had a prostatectomy. PSA continues to rise, but prior imaging is negative. And we're seeing here, this is actually a Hyler node um, that uh, was bright on PSMA um, and was not clearly appreciated on other imaging modalities. So this is an opportunity where PSMA PET can provide a patient a more focused and targeted treatment um, as a pair to kind of systemic treatment alone. Now, there have been a few different studies looking at this, but again, uh, lesions with higher radio tracer uptake uh, that would be typical for uh, prostate cancer, but have a lack of this anatomic abnormality, sometimes you know, being attributed to clinical correlation needed or unclear, nonspecific. Now, this gives us definition and much more confidence that this may be an area of recurrence. And again, it's not only limited to just patients who've had prostatectomy, but even those who've had radiation. And this is particularly important as you were to plan out a field for say salvage radiation. Um, and this area may not be included in that prior planning uh, if this was not appreciated through PSMA PET. Now, here's the exciting part uh, in things that are actively going on in our department. 
Um, it's the use of intraoperative PSMA PET. Now we've appreciated the fact that PSMA PET can identify areas sometimes outside of our standard uh, dissection sites, which may be concerning for uh, small volumes of disease. Now this has been done in mouse models already uh, to demonstrate that um, these areas, even outside of our usual targets, can not only exist, but shine bright intraoperatively. Um, so I just uh, bring your attention down to the lower portion of this slide that showed not only was the primary tumor bright, but also this helped us know that there may be potentially residual disease left at the um, resection site. So in this sense, it's highlighting a potential positive margin that may not be appreciated just with uh, gross inspection intraoperatively. And here's really highlighting, again, that green area that's avid and glowing with our Firefly system um, with the XI uh, intuitive dimension robot, um, that this may be an area where we can even use PSMA PET to identify potential or future positive margins and uh, kind of address that during the same operative session. Now, there's currently a phase one study going on in our institution with Dr. Wynn and Dr. Carroll, looking at men with high risk disease uh, who opted for radical prostatectomy with extended pelvic lymph node dissection. Now, this is again, through the Firefly system, uh, through the XI robot, uh, patients are given the radio tracer before uh, surgery. And then we're able to toggle between our standard white light and then Firefly to identify potential nodes or areas of possible positive surgical margins. Now there's also a fluorescent scanner that is used um, kind of off to the side within the operating room, which again gives us our histopathology and is an efficacy endpoint um, for the trial itself. So there's more information to come, more phases of this to come, but it's incredibly exciting. Now, the trial being at its midpoint currently, there have been no major adverse events. And we've currently accrued seven patients with, with complete histopathologic data. And we see that this tracer has actually achieved pathologic confirmation of tumor fluorescence in 100% of patients in this cohort of seven. Now, using the firefly mode, uh, we see excellent discrimination between tumor and again, um, tracers that has been uptake by areas of cancer compared to background. So we've really seen a distinct definition or difference between background and minimal background noise. And we see that this actually outperforms standard imaging, white light endoscopy or standard light that we use during surgery, as well as MRI, CT, and truss when we look back at a preoperative imaging and evaluation. So there's more to come for this, but I think that this could in nearly revolutionize how we approach uh, positive surgical margins and our resection. Now, optimal patients in which this would be used, clinical situations still need to be uh, further investigated, but this is uh, quite hopeful um, and quite uh, exciting for our field. Now, I'd like to thank everyone involved uh, for slides, uh, guidance, mentorship, and I'm open to any questions. That's a great overview, Sam, of sort of, you know, what, what are the, you know, critical uh, elements in prostate cancer, sort of what we're, you know, what's going to be coming down the pipeline. Um, question for you from a practical point of view, then, for PSMA, obviously, it's FDA approved now. Uh, however, what's the availability in the real world and what are is there limitations of what payers will approve or not approve? You may not... In, you know, Dr. Carroll, if you're still on, if you wanted, if, if Sam doesn't, it can't answer that, I will, uh, we'll see if you have any, but I think, I think the, you know, what's the practicalities is going to be the limiting factor at this point, because clearly I think both, pre, you know, high risk patients pre definitive treatment, but also failure after definitive treatment and even beyond, you know, identifying oligometastatic disease and we start targeting those, we need to be doing probably a lot more PSMA PET scans. So, how easy or not easy is it to get nowadays in the U.S.? Yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, anecdotally, just trying to get in my own clinic, I can, it can be quite difficult. Um, and some of that's just due to the availability of the marker in areas that are capable of doing PSMA PET scans, which will increase over time, but limit that to specific geographic regions. So it's 
one area in which like UCLA or UCSF having used this from an investigational standpoint currently have already been kind of positioned to be areas that could use it, um, but that's not as commonly used or available as even like fluciclovine or CTs or bone scans yet. Um, that also brings me to the next point when it comes to from a financial standpoint and coverage, um, insurance companies are not yet uh, as excited as we are about using PSMA PET. Um, so when it comes to more advanced PET scans and PET imaging, I think as this continues to be used and the evidence builds and potential incorporation into guidelines, that will be kind of more feet under the fire of insurance companies to cover this. And I think once it's covered, we'll see kind of a, an explosion of some sort um, to kind of broader use um, now that finance is not a barrier um, for both the institution and the patient. Sorry, you may hear kids screaming. All right, thank you so much, Sam, for an uh, excellent overview of sort of the state of the art for prostate cancer. Uh, for interest of keeping on time, next speaker is Dr. Seema Porton, who will talk about some uh, issues for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and may touch a little bit about you know, the AUA guidelines for hematuria had just been revised and they're a little bit different as well. So there's some nuances to that. Uh, Seema? Hello everyone, thanks for having me today. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the management of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, including some of the, um, the new guidelines as well as some new treatments. Uh, the progress in this space has been exciting and the number of clinical trials and options available to our patients are increasing by the day. Um, are you able to see this? Yeah, okay. Um, these are my disclosures, and let's start with the case. So this is a 49-year-old woman who presented to her PCP for an annual physical. She was found to have three to five RBCs per high-powered field. Overall, she's pretty healthy. She did have a history of breast cancer. She is perimenopausal, was a never smoker, and, has, um, and was a retired librarian. Uh, labs and hematocrit all within normal limits for the most part. So when you look at the AUA microhematuria guidelines, which were released in 2020, a big change was risk stratification. And so when you look across the risk categories, there's low, intermediate, and high. And these are differentiated by a few things, age, uh, gender, um, <clears throat> history of smoking, and as well as the degree of hematuria sort of will risk stratify patients between low, intermediate, and high risk. And I do mention though that, that the devil's in the details. You gotta look at the fine print on these. So for her, it was, she would have been considered low risk. So you would have been able to do a repeat urinalysis within, within six months because she's a younger woman, never smoker, um, low amount of RBCs per high powered field, and you would think no additional risk factors for urothelial carcinoma, as well as this is her first episode of, of microhematuria. Um, but you had to delve into her past medical history a little bit deeper. For her breast cancer, she actually was treated with a cyclophosphamide-based chemotherapy, and that actually counts as one of the risk factors that would kind of um, up the ante for doing a cystoscopy in her a little bit sooner versus waiting that six months uh, for a repeat urinalysis. So when you, when you look at those lower urinary tract symptoms, family history of bladder cancer or Lynch syndrome, and definitely occupational exposures or having a chronic indwelling for, foreign body also up your risk classification. So although this is great guidance and hopefully will reduce intensity in patients who don't really need um, the, the full workup with a cystoscopy and cross-sectional imaging, that, that, um, that you do have to be careful of these smaller details and a patient history is, is really important. So for her, she did get oh, a renal Dr. ultrasound. Martin, yes. Sorry, um, the slideshow is stuck on our oh. end. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm sorry about that. Maybe reset it, Seema. It looks, it yeah, looks like it was not in presenter view. But, yes. and then. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, let me try again. Sorry about that. And I will pull up those last slides. Um, let's see. And share. Works? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yes. All right. 
I'm going to see if I can make it go back a little bit. I, this is the, the microhematuria guidelines in terms of looking at low, intermediate, and high risk. And then the most important thing is the little box at the bottom, um, which had the little number annotation, which really talks about the risk factors in, in more detail. And so that is the one thing to be, be mindful of um, when risk stratifying patients with microhematuria. So she did end up getting a renal ultrasound and an in-office cystoscopy, which showed a two centimeter papillary tumor with a one centimeter satellite lesion next to it on the left lateral wall. Her CT urogram was ordered post cystoscopy uh, because of the presence of what's likely a bladder cancer or tumor, and there was no evidence of upper tract disease. And her cytology actually came back as a high grade urothelial carcinoma. Although looking at something um, from cystoscopy, you know, I would have thought that this this wouldn't have given a high-grade urothelial carcinoma cytology. However, this could have been a high-grade TA tumor, um, but its appearance looked a little bit more low-grade, although we're not great about telling that on, on, um, on just white light cystoscopy in the clinic. And so not pictured here is the papillary tumors, which were resected. They were easily seen. They were white and blue light positive. Um, at UCSF, we do tend to use uh, blue light in the operating room if in certain cases where we would find it would be useful. And mainly that's for cases where you're really suspicious about carcinoma in situ. And, um, and so what's pictured here actually on the left side is the white light picture uh, of, her, of her bladder. And on the, on the right hand side is the blue light picture of her bladder. And what you can kind of see is this really bright pink enhancement, and that actually ended up being carcinoma in situ. So when you look at the use of blue light cystoscopy, either at the time in the operating room with a TRBT or a, a newly approved indication with flexible cystoscopy in the clinic, uh, what you do see is a higher tumor detection rate, and this is primarily um, in the detection of carcinoma in situ. And this is across multiple randomized control trials and meta-analyses. You see the same thing in the clinic where you get about um, 20 plus percent more recurrences detected only on blue light. Uh, in terms of whether this actually changes um, clinical, clinical judgment, like what you do um, down the road in the future, meaning that if it was somebody who had a high grade uh, TA bladder cancer, and you were already planning on doing BCG, does the detection of carcinoma in situ change your plan? It might if it does change your AUA risk stratification group. So at times, blue light has been um, important at changing the treatment plan. And so in many of these studies, that is also looked at, and that happens in about 15 to 20% of patients. So when you look at like a summary of recommended use cases, a lot of people ask, how do I choose when to use blue light um, in the operating room or in clinic for, for surveillance. And I put happy faces over the indications where, where I um, and others here at UCSF tend to use blue light. So for low risk disease, if you're following someone for biopsy and fulguration, you are able to get a little bit, I think a better clearance of the bladder with fulgurations in the office. The really nice thing about the flexible blue light system is that it has a ability to suction. Um, so you can have almost like a continuous flow. So you're able to fill and empty the bladder very quickly with, with the suction and it, it does make procedure a, a lot quicker. Um, in the operating room, I tend to use blue light for repeat resections if I'm suspicious that there's carcinoma in situ. And in patients who have a positive cytology, but you're not really seeing anything on, on white light and you're planning on doing random biopsies, I will also do targeted biopsies with, with the use of blue light. In COVID times where it was more difficult to take patients to the operating room, um, I did use blue light in the clinic a lot more post BCG to look at whether carcinoma in situ was responsive or not, because I will talk about this a little later, is that there's many, many more treatment options for patients uh, with BCG and responsive disease when BCG stops working or um, fails to work in the first time. Let's see if I can get these slides to go. 
Okay, so um, because she had high grade TA disease, a mix of high grade and low grade, but as well as carcinoma in situ, she was able to get BCG induction plus maintenance. And she did pretty well. Um, we did a white light cystoscopy after induction and ended up and did another white light cystoscopy after maintenance uh, because her cytology was negative and things appeared, appeared well. And really, if there was carcinoma in situ present after just induction, it wouldn't change what I what I did, meaning giving more BCG. So hence, we we stuck with a white light cystoscopy in the clinic. Many have struggled with this, which is multiple BCG shortages. So how were we able to get this patient BCG? Here at UCSF too, we have struggled with a, a very tenuous and unpredictable supply. And this is through multiple reasons. And this has been present since 2012. Uh, we are currently in the third or fourth shortage, depending on how you define it. And this is primarily because there's only one um, producer of BCG in the United States due to Santa Fe Pasteur closing their production um, secondary to a massive fungal contamination. So that whole operation sort of folded um, back in 2017. And why is it so hard to make BCG? There's a pretty slow production process. The doubling time of BCG is over 16 hours versus 20 minutes for E. coli. So each batch takes three months. And when you grow something in culture for that long, um, fungal contaminations are sort of rampant uh, depending upon the production process. And so Merck has been unable to meet the demands of the recent shortages. However, they did announce the building of new plants and factories to, uh, to address this, but that would take about five, six, seven years. Um, you need a pretty high dose compared to the vaccine. One of those little vials that you can use for a vaccine, you can use 10 to 15 times uh, versus you use just one for one installation for a patient. And then a, a, a cynical way to look at it is there's a little financial incentive for creating more BCG. So what has been our strategy from a practical standpoint? Well, basics are basics, high quality TRBT, re-resections, um, to ensure complete tumor clearance from the bladder is really important, particularly if you're, you're unable to get BCG or unable to give enough BCG. Um, other basics like smoking cessation are also really important. Um, clinical trials. We did have one clinical trial open to bring in a different strain of BCG, the Tokyo strain, which is currently under review for potentially an, an alternate BCG source. Um, right now, the FDA has only approved the Thai strain, which is uh, the strain in North America uh, here in the United States. And so we're unable to use the multiple strains across the world um, here in the U.S. right now. Uh, that trial actually has accrued. It was a, over a thousand patients and, and now is close to accrual. So we're back in that, um, that time spot or period where again, our access to any BCG is, is fairly limited. So we focused on those who get greatest benefit. So patients with high grade T1 or those prioritized or those with carcinoma in situ. So we prioritize those patients to get full dose for at least a year. And I'll show some evidence behind that of why we, why we are, are using this strategy and selected that. You can reduce the dose if we absolutely have to. And if we completely run out of BCG, uh, we have been using a doublet chemotherapy with gemcitabine and docetaxel. For high-grade TA multifocal disease, um, we've been using mitomycin or a doublet chemotherapy. For those with a solitary disease, and this is a pretty rare popula uh, patient population, only about 5 to 10 percent of patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer have this disease state. Um, we use adjuvant gemcitabine or mitomycin. And for those patients who have high volume, low grade TA disease or recurrent disease, we've been really using gemcitabine. Uh, there will be a clinical trial opening for these last two groups of patients at UCSF soon um, using a new medication called natafaragine feridenovac, which is an adenoviral vector uh, that has been um, showing really promising results in the unresponsive space. And so this is sort of moving this up in the spectrum and hopefully that will take some of the pressure off in using BCG for patients with intermediate risk, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer.
So where do we get our kind of data for doing this? Um, so our colleagues in Europe looked at a pre-shortage pre era and a post-shortage era. And the, probably the most important thing about this slide is that you definitely had more recurrences where BCG was restricted. What was interesting is when you looked at in that restricted group, the rate of recurrence, particularly for high grade T1 and CIS, as well as progression was decreased by almost 70% if they got a full year. And that was our impetus of, of really reserving BCG for those patients. Um, for dose reduction, Brazil actually has had shortages for longer than the rest of the world has had. And they've been using their strain at a half dose for a pretty long time. Um, they also are unable to afford mitomycin and some of the other chemotherapeutic agents uh, to use in lieu. And so they've been focused on a re dose reduction strategy for about 10 to 15 years. Um, and their data sort of shows that when they use this a half dose with induction plus maintenance, recurrence rates and progression rates are not any different between the two groups. And so we also tend to use a half dose if we have to and pair up patients and logistically that ends up working um, uh, well for us. So why the doublet chemotherapy agent with gemcitabine and docetaxel? Our group as well as Hopkins and uh, those in Iowa have sort of shown that you can get a decent recurrence-free survival at one year um, with just induction, so that's six weeks at 50%, you can up that to 81% with maintenance. The two-year rates are not as promising, but are better than nothing. And so this is why we have, have focused on using gemcitabine and docetaxel in um, some of the higher risk non-muscle invasive groups if we, if we have to. So back to this patient. Um, so for her uh, uh, surveillance cystoscopy, after getting an induction plus maintenance dose of, of BCG, we ended up doing this in the clinic um, because it was also it coincided with the time during COVID. And so when you look up at the at the top screen, a part of the screen, the left and the and the right really show some BCG inflammation. And this is actually not a blue light positive area. This is highlighting inflammation. And this is one of the kind of uh, drawbacks of, of blue light cystoscopy is that you have to be mindful of false positives and this sort of maroon looking lesions um, because those aren't actually true blue light positives. You got to really see that bright pink. So when you look at the, at the bottom two pictures on white light and then blue light, you can definitively see this, like a, it looks like an oval patch. And so that was biopsied in the clinic and was um, found to be CIS. I did also end up biopsying this thing adjacent a little bit superior to the right because that looked a little more abnormal as well. And that actually ended up being um, nothing, no cancer seen. So there's this pretty confusing BCG unresponsive definition, right? Um, patients who don't reach a disease-free state at six months after starting BCG. And so that's basically having the presence of CIS after two cycles of BCG. You can do induction, induction, or induction plus maintenance. Uh, this also includes high-grade TA disease that recurs after two cycles of BCG. For high-grade T1 disease, you wouldn't wait this long to sort of put a patient into this category. You would sort of call it after just induction BCG if that recurrence uh, was high-grade T1. And so that's when you would not give more BCG. And that's essentially what this um, definition is supposed to help denote. Uh, who's not going to benefit from more BCG or who will have adverse outcomes if you give more um, in that setting. The other part of this definition is when patients have been treated with good, like adequate BCG, at least induction plus maintenance, and they have a recurrence within 12 months um, after having a complete response. This is another group that are at high risk of progression and metastasis. So what are the options for treatment? It's not an option anymore. Uh, our guidelines say that radical cystectomy should be offered to every patient who kind of meet these definitions, which is 100% true. Um, however, there are a lot more options now that have some which are going through FDA approval and some that will be FDA approved. This is a fairly busy graph, but it sort of lists all the different options that are approved. FDA has a little star by it, and that's pembrolizumab. And so that's the, the introduction of a systemic agent 
uh, with immunotherapy into this uh, disease space that is not metastatic. And so the pembrolizumab trial or, or Keytruda or the keynote trial showed that in patients who have BCG unresponsive carcinoma in situ, that um, if you gave pembrolizumab, which is usually given at every three weeks uh, for two years or in every six week dosing that was recently approved for two years, there's a 41% complete response, meaning no CIS present at three months. This does not appear to be durable in, in a large group of patients. However, if, if you get a response, many will have that response persist. So about 20% of patients in the end at one year will still be disease free in their bladder and um, essentially not need, a, not need a cystectomy. And that appears to be durable past that, that 12 month uh, time point up to two years. And so that's, that is, um, it can be looked at in two ways. It can be looked at as, wow, that is a systemic agent. And it looks like only 20% of patients are, are sort of rendered disease free uh, for a long time. Or you can look at it as like, we've saved about 20% um, of patients from, from a cystectomy, hopefully. And so it, it is a new strategy and it's exciting that there's actually like an option for patients. Um, a new kind of drug that is on the horizon that is going through an FDA approval is adstilidrin or natafaragine feridenovac. And this is a, a viral vector drug based on an adenovirus. Um, the response rate at three months is it was good at 53%, but again, the durability is difficult with these non-muscle invasive patients. For, for many, you're sort of uh, kicking the bucket down the road a little bit and, um, and seeing if you're able to avoid or delay cystectomy uh, and hopefully improve quality of life that way. Uh, whether that's true is to be debated and, and being studied right now is that is what we're doing by moving cystectomy down the road, important to patients, improving quality of life, and also hopefully preventing um, uh, death from progression or metastatic disease. With adstilidrin, the great part about this is this is still given in a urologist office and it's given every three months. And so in terms of treatment intensity, this is much more favorable than um, some of the other drugs that, that, that are sort of being developed in this space, like vicinium, which is an E. coli toxin. But this is given like twice a week for a few weeks and then every week for like two months. And then again, every three weeks for a year, which is a huge treatment intensity. And so if you look at this bottom row about potential doctor visits over two years, um, it does not favor vicinium, which is almost 64 uh, separate encounters for a patient. Gemcitabine docetaxel is used in this space too and, and is fairly successful, has a little bit longer what appears to be durable response rate at 60%. But again, this is not in a prospective study. This is a, a bunch of institutions gathering their retrospective data and so there's likely bias in that. A, a new drug that came on the horizon, it doesn't actually have a name yet, it's called N803, but it's an IL-15 super agonist that's actually given with BCG. And it appears to have a pretty, pretty spectacular three month response rate. Uh, durability is still being studied as the results were just presented at GUASCO, but it's something that would, is gonna be exciting. Um, it's given very similar to um, many of our other intravesical therapies and, and so would fit into a intravesical paradigm quite nicely. What are some clinical factors that, that we can kind of use? Not all the BCG unresponsive states are equivalent, right? Those with high-grade T1 disease with CIS or just high-grade T1 disease don't have a zero rate of lymph node positive disease. And so re-resection and imaging are really necessary in these patients before saying that, hey, I think we have time to try something to save your bladder. Um, and those with variant histology, that's really unpredictable. And so we really do advocate for a, a cystectomy um, at, at this time. Patients with just carcinoma in situ, they're not, um, they're also a fairly unpredictable group. We don't really know if we see one little area with CIS versus CIS all over the bladder, whether that changes the risk of lymph node positive disease or development of muscle invasive disease, but the rates are somewhere around 
10 to 25%, depending on the series, with about 5% of patients who have carcinoma in site two at the time of cystectomy having uh, lymph node positivity. Um, not all BCG unresponsive states have the same window of opportunity, right? So for patients with high-grade TA disease, it's the, the metastatic rate or mortality rate is 0.4% at six months, 1% at one year, and 2.5% at 1.5 years. And this is from missing a window. Um, so it's, it's low and it's higher for other states, but the, we don't have those numbers really reported. It was really for high-grade TA. Uh, in patients who got pembrolizumab on that trial, a lot of people wanted to know, well, if they had cystectomy, if it didn't work, how many were T2 at the time? And it was, it was a low number. It was 8%. Um, and one patient, this was in after a year of stopping treatment. Another way of looking at it is extra vesicle disease at the time of cystectomy is somewhere around one to eleven percent in this group. When you when when patients finally agree to undergo it or it's finally decided to go do that um, as as a definitive treatment option. The two graphs below show the cancer specific and overall survival in patients who got gemcitabine and docetaxel across many different institutions. And if you look, it's pretty um, it's pretty good at around eighty seven percent. And so there is some time, but you don't have like years at, at, at trying other things before proceeding to a more definitive option. So there is time to try it, um, possibly multiple treatments. You have more window of, of that duration with high grade TA disease and, um, and carcinoma in site too. And you really don't have as much give with high grade T1 disease. Uh, you generally only have time for like one strategy. So three months of trying something before, before it's time to um, move to a more definitive option. The other really important thing to highlight is not all these treatment options were approved for each clinical state. Um, all of the pembrolizumab option is approved for patients who have CIS with or without papillary disease. Um, this is not for just a high-grade TA recurrence after BCG alone. Uh, the indication was for carcinoma and site 2 specifically. Natafair gene did include all disease states, but those higher-risk patients weren't represented in, in, the, in the actual patient number by that much. Only 5% of patients had that very high-risk state of T1 plus CIS, and there's only 15 patients um, who had high-grade T1 disease alone. And so it's kind of important to, to sort of... Um, not to extrapolate across all of the disease states when the indication was for a particular uh, group of patients. Patients do wanna keep their bladder. This was a study we did with about 845 patients, caregivers and uh, physicians, medical oncology, as well as urologists. And the important part about this graph, if, if you look over at prevention of cystectomy as what people thought was a relevant endpoint for a non-muscle invasive bladder cancer treatment, it had the rank order, which is this blue bar of one. So across the board, patients, caregivers, as well as physicians thought that this was the best clinical endpoint for these non-muscle invasive um, bladder cancer trial designs. And it just does highlight that patients would like to keep their bladder if at all possible. What are some other things that we use to choose treatments. Well, if someone's having a lot of bladder pain for their intravesical therapy is um, likely not doable or a great idea. And so in that situation, um, I do refer to medical oncology for, for pembrolizumab uh, consideration for those patients to give them an option. Or this might be the patient that you talk about that maybe cystectomy might actually improve quality of life. And I think Dr. Pruthi is going to talk about some of our minimally invasive options that help patients recover after a surgery uh, like that a little later. Um, we do know from our data at UCSF that 25 to 40 percent of patients with non-muscle invasive disease have a significant quality of, uh, of life impairment from sleep, from urinary function or from pain. And about 50% actually have uh, significant anxiety and difficulty with coping with treatments, with the insurity, with multiple cystoscopies. Um, it's also fairly burdensome on patients. There's distance to travel, treatment intensity, time off of work, family obligations, and cost 
So about 25% of patients have some significant financial toxicity when we looked at this in, in, in this group of patients. None of these are absolute contraindications to a particular treatment, but they could be potentially addressable or re reversible factors that should be discussed in terms of figuring out what the right option for someone is. So to conclude, there are more options than ever for patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer after BCG has failed. There are clinical trials that are opening across multiple disease states and hopefully will give more options besides BCG because a shortage is likely to persist until alternative sources or treatments are found um, based on some of the, the, the data that I was talking about. Um, the basics of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer management are as important as ever, right? Modifiable factors, smoking cessation primarily factors in this, as well as performing a high quality TRBT with, with whatever tools are available to you. And um, with that, I will conclude and, and take questions. Great, excellent talk, Seema. There's a lot to cover for this. And for the sake of staying on time, I know Heiko had a question. I don't think anybody's working on an mRNA version of BCG. I think uh, it's not as pressing as the COVID-19 crisis, but you know, potentially there may be new mechanisms to make it a little bit easier. Um, but again, we have time at the breakout to delve into some more details. I know the pembrolizumab is a, is a you know, hot topic. Although one quick question, Seema, in your case that you showed, you use blue light post BCG. What's the guidelines? What's the current status FDA approval for that? And what's the, you know, what's the, do you want to do it three months or a month or six months? When, when do you have fewer false positives? So um, the, the, the um, approval for using uh, blue light post BCG uh, happened with the approval with the flexible system. And so it is valid to use. Uh, in general, it's four to six weeks after BCG uh, in terms of reducing false positives with blue light. Um, in the clinic, like for this patient, I will use it if it will change, change what I do. And so for her, she had had what was adequate BCG with induction and one maintenance. And so there really should be no cancer present at that, at that six month cystoscopy. And so I did that with blue light um, in the clinic because she had had a blue light positive lesion in, in the OR and that's when that carcinoma in situ popped up. Um, but it, it sort of goes with the timing of a cystoscopy either way after BCG, which is about four to six weeks after treatment kind of falls with this with that same paradigm. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Seema. Uh, and the next speaker is Dr. Raj Pruthi, um, who really was an early doctor and pioneer of minimal invasive approaches for cystectomy for patients with bladder cancer. And he's going to talk about what's new in robotic oncology surgery. <clears throat> thanks, Max. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us on the Saturday morning, the, the uh, first weekend of March Madness, which is my favorite time of the year. And if anybody chose Oral Roberts in North uh, Texas to win, um, I'd like to have you raise your hand and give you a shout out. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, I wanna talk to say that I have no disclosures related to this talk. And this is important because I'm gonna talk quite a bit about robotics and the Da Vinci robot by Intuitive. And I've, I don't have never had stocks or just or ownership or compensation from them. So when I think about robotic surgery and geo-oncology, it's typically involves prostatectomy, cystectomy, nephrectomy, and RPLND. And we'll touch on those last couple at the end, but I'm gonna focus mainly on prostatectomy and cystectomy as far as where are we going and what are we doing. I think we've seen this now over several decades, the benefits of minimally invasive surgery, the gallbladder surgery, nephrectomy, and then prostatectomy even. I think we're even seeing it in cystectomy from the large kind of stem to stern incision to a, a minimally invasive approach. Um, the benefits of minimally invasive surgery and robotics, I think we've seen less pain, less blood loss for things like cystectomy, especially less fluid imbalances and bowel manipulation. But I think it's always important in oncology to make sure we maintain the oncologic integrity of the operation. Bladder cancer, for example, is a potentially unforgiving disease and nothing we should do should compromise that. We don't have a salvage, great salvage treatments. 
um, and make sure this again isn't a surgical stunt that we're doing that adds or times and costs and is something that can be performed uh, by the broader community. Just a little historical perspective on the prostatectomy and to give a nod to really the first laparoscopic procedure in urology by Dr. Clayman in 1991. We saw laparoscopic uh, prostatectomy adopted a couple of years later in Europe. It really wasn't more widely adopted till the end of that decade, 2000, by Guillaume and Valenciennes and some larger centers in France and in Germany, but really did not take off in the US. And as somebody who uh, tried some of those early laparoscopic prostatectomies, they were incredibly difficult uh, to do. Um, the first reports of robotic prostatectomy were, the first one was in Europe, and then uh, Dr. Menon and his group in 2001 reported on 30 patients. We've seen reports of single site prostatectomy, and you can see some of the examples here. Um, and, and, you know, the challenge with the single site is that, you know, they don't allow triangulation kind of within the body the way we normally like to. And that's what the single port robotic prostatectomy by Da Vinci has allowed us. So this is the platform uh, and it looks like this. And again, you can see, and I'll show you some sort of cartoon videos that kind of show what's happening with that. This is a patient of ours that we kind of, just to show you a little bit of the setup, the incision is made we, in an extra peritoneal fashion below the umbilicus. And then we use this balloon and I'll show you in a video to inflate that extra peritoneal space like a laparoscopic hernia. Um, we were doing everything through that port, that space uh, a little bit bigger, but then opted to use our assistant ports on the outside to just make it a little bit easier. Um, so this is again, that cartoon that's sort of showing how things move within. And, and in this case, the patient's supine and we're able to do everything kind of again, pre-peritoneally. Um, I'm just going to show you this little bit of a kind of a video uh, of what this looks like when it's deployed within the body. And you can see the ability, again, what's key to this is things aren't crossing at the level of the skin, but really the, the movement and the triangulation happens within the body, which I think is the, the key difference. And you can see there's, there's no wrists, but they're elbows to what you do. And everything's in this kind of narrow, confined uh, space. Um, let me just move on here. Um, I want to show you um, kind of a, a speeded up version of, uh, can everybody, one second here, let me. Let me, let me stop this for a second. I'm gonna move this back just a little bit. So this is in kind of fast speed uh, all the way at the beginning. So here's the, the scope being put in and you can see that the balloon expands and we can watch that happening. And now we're in the pre-peritoneal space. And again, I, and I, I, did, I did this quickly in, in a faster speed because these are all the same steps that we're doing in a typical multi-port robotic prostatectomy. Uh, you can see the instruments all come in together there. And what I want to show you, what I think is a beneficial, in addition to the camera flexing, is that third arm that you have, that I, that I feel like in a multi-port prostatectomy, you just kind of put it in a space and you can see that third arm holding over. So you're really retracting actively with yourself. Um, and this is us kind of finishing up here. And then we could put the DVC stitch. So I had to kind of do this in, in a anterior fashion. And just to show you sort of the ability to teach and learn it, this is our uh, chief, re uh, our senior resident, Mira Chapiti, doing some of this case here uh, as we move along. Um, so I think it's, and here we're just putting a kind of stay stitch behind the bladder. But again, you, you, you act, I'm actively using that third arm throughout this case. And I think that's beneficial. Um, the, the other thing that's interesting is you can, typically you have the, camera at 12 o'clock, the arms at three, six, and nine. And you can flip that around 180 degrees and have the camera at the bottom and your, your active instrument up top. And here we're doing a bit of a bladder neck preservation. Uh, and we'll come through that posteriorly. <clears throat> and there's our assistant. And then again, that third arm can be used above or below. 
I'll still keep it on the below side, but sometimes it's nice to have actually you beta retraction upwards with this. Um, and, and these we're doing all extra peritoneal now. Um, the the uh, Jihad Koch at the Cleveland Clinic has done this as an outpatient operation. We haven't tried to do that yet. I think it's a little different at the Cleveland Clinic outpatient, I think means you go to the Ritz-Carlton that's connected to the Cleveland Clinic. But um, again, here you can see our, us doing our, getting our pedicles. It is different though. We're doing this again, extra peritoneal. I'll use the uh, air seal, five air seal. And what I've learned is that you can't use the, the pressures of 15, which we typically would on the five air seal extra peritoneal. I and others and sharing this, it's, it's a learning experience, but patients will have significant sub Q emphysema with that. And I think it's the, it seems to be the culprit is the air seal. Um, so we'll just do this typically now at a pressure of 10 and that, that in, in speaking with, with a group at the Cleveland Clinic and others, seems to be has resolved the issue of uh, having sub-Q emphysema uh, and problems related to that. Um, and then you'll see us just kind of finishing up here. And again, you see that third arm pulling back on the prostate. Um, again, that flexible camera allows us to look around corners and I think has been very, very valuable. Um, and again, we could pull, pull things side to side with that. You can see I just did that there to come back to the middle. And then we'll kind of finish up there. Let's move us ahead here a little bit. We're just kind of doing our anastomosis. This is something that takes a little bit of a learning because again, you don't have a wrist on this, right? You have an elbow. So it's not like pure laparoscopy where you're at the end of sticks, but you have an elbow, but you don't have that wrist and something that you get used to with, uh, um, I think the XI or multiport. But I do think patients have less pain by staying extra peritoneal. We do all of this in a supine position. They don't need to be in a steep Trendelenburg position. So that helps from, from that perspective. And obviously staying out of the bowel cavity uh, ha has potential benefits. And here we're kind of finished up and we're just gonna test that with 120 cc's. And then it fills up. I'm gonna show you one last thing here. I think having the video is, see we had a little bit of a bleeder. We can bring that third arm in, which is, which is activated. Um, let me go back to um, my talk. Here. Okay, and uh, I want to show you this uh, video of new applications that uh, of the single port. Again, it works very well because it's in a very small space, and you could and and I like that actually in the prostatectomy because it allows you again to be actively working in that small space. So this is a patient that had a failed kidney transplant on the right side, a pain pump on the right side, and then a new kidney transplant on the left side. So a very hostile abdomen, one where radiation therapy really doesn't seem to be a great option for them, uh, given the pelvic kidney and a, a robot, single port robotic perineal prostatectomy. Uh, Jihad Koch at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, also kind of the first to really up, do this and, and take the single port to uh, this. Ad, and he's looked at his multi-port and single port experience and has seen less narcotic use in that and less length of stay. One of the things that, that we found uh, in our experience has been actually, uh, I found actually a shorter OR time with the single port than the multi-port. So there's a rectum looks clear, and then the next steps are going to be the anastomosis. And I'll just, and my point is just to show you that actually this can be done and maybe a, maybe an opportunity for patients again with that hostile abdomen. In this video, we present our technique. I don't know if you can hear that. So this is a, cystic. I'll move us along here. Cystic. So I want, I want to show you this from the standpoint of. Our patient is a 59 year old male with muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma. This is status post for four cycle of new adjuvant chemotherapy and now presenting for radical cystectomy. So this is, a, this is a, a, a video we submitted, kind of a how-to video for... This is the patient in supine positioning with mild Trendelenburg. 
This is uh, one of our oh, residents, Avi Baskin, dictating that. Two point five centimeter incision for the single port. This is superior to the umbilicus, just lateral to the left side. We place a twelve millimeter assist port in the right lower quadrant at the site where the ileal conduit will be matured later in the case. Finally, a five millimeter assist port is placed in the right. So this is all intraperitoneally. Uh... For instrumentation, we use a monopole. And some of the first of the descriptions port. of, of doing single port for a cystectomy, six, six, but obviously we have to be intraperitoneal for this case. The camera is at the 12 o'clock position. And I'll, we'll take you through this. Um, first step of the and this is the same thing when I do it in a multi port fashion. I'll do it in this same technique. So I don't want to duplicate that. Or the expected course for ligation. Once the ureter is dissected down to the ureteral vesicle junction, we use a 3 0 vicral tie. So you can see three active clip. instruments in there the, th the, the six o'clock, the three, the nine o'clock, and the. Here we show the left side with another hemolock clip with a white 3 0 vicral, and us detaching the ureter from the ureteral vesicle junction. Step two is the posterior dissection. We incise the posterior. Here you can see us incising the posterior. You can see the incisions from each ureteral dissection, the vas there on the left and right. Note how we lift the bladder and the prostate off of the rectum to develop the right space. And again, I'll just move us through this so you can see kind of the concept of what we're doing. This is the exact same steps that I would be doing in a multi-port robotic case. I do like, I think there are, the data is now fairly clear on uh, 15 years since our first descriptions of, of robotic cystectomy. There's a large RAZOR trial, which is a randomized trial of, of open versus robotic published in Lancet that has shown uh, that we were part of that has shown no difference in oncologic outcomes. The thing that is clear is there's less blood loss. Um, less narcotic use with the robotic approach. Some studies have suggested less complications with it as well. Oh, we see the little dangers. So I, th I think, in my opinion, for patients who are straightforward, this is a, a, a clear advantage. They, they get home quicker. They feel better, faster. Um, and again, these are patients, obviously, that have been through a lot with new adjuvant chemotherapy. So to show you here, kind of us is used to ligate and transect the vascular. And there we are, just stapling the pedicle. The endovascular stapler is used to ligate and transect the vascular pedicle. You can see we got almost the whole bladder up there. Here we continue with a posterior dissection to free up. We're underneath the prostate, the prostate there completely. One as a back. So I'm just going to show you here us going coming anteriorly. This place for attraction and attention to the lymph node dissection. And here we've clipped the ure urethra distally and proximally, so we've actually had no spillage. We uh, turn our attention to the lymph node dissection. And just a little bit of a node dissection just to show the you. stoma is protruding, and you can see that the five assist port is where we placed the JP drain. Thus far, we have completed five single port radical cystectomies here I think in CSF. We're up to seven, and you can see that the perioperative outcomes length of stay is reasonable. Uh, outcomes compared to uh, average four to five. Blood loss very, very low with this. Um, so I think future directions. I think we are seeing an increased worldwide experience. I mentioned that Razor trial. Uh, which has sort of given us the highest level of evidence. We don't see a lot of randomized controlled trials in, in the surgical literature. And just show you a little bit of a brief example of doing the diversion intracorporally. Here is what we would do in stapling the bowel, harvesting the bowel. I'll show you this kind of briefly as we go through this. Uh, again, just to show you kind of where we're taking things from a robotic standpoint in urologic oncology. We talked a lot about the prostate and now here's uh, again, teeing up the the, the uh, bowel segment that will be used for the diversion. Now we're restoring the bowel continuity. So we put these these stitches in the anti-mesenteric side and it kind of shows um, the, uh, the stapler. So just like your GIA would take you down uh, uh, side to side functional end to end anastomosis. And we're going to close that there. And you can take one or two bites down if you need it open. So this is a 60 stapler. 
and then we'll and we have those sutures that we put in on the anti-mesenteric to keep us kind of honest on the anti-mesenteric side we can look down make sure it's open and then i'll use a stapler to just close that and here's where we're doing the ureter enteric anastomosis um, so into this is actually in a patient i think that has a, a neobladder that you can see kind of extending down below and, and you can do this in any way. This is a Vicryl, a Monocryl, whatever you use. You could do Bricker, Wallace. Wallace is actually for a conduit very nicely to do this way. You bring both ureters side by side. And sewing is one of the things that the robot does very, very well, right? It, it allows you to articulate and scale movements on a fine level. And then put, putting the stents up. I think we're near the end here and closing that anastomosis. So um, I wanted to touch on a couple last things when we talk about uh, kind of where we're going in robotic urologic oncology. I'm going to show you a couple of videos that are really kind of the, the most complex of cases robotically. Here's a case of a patient with a renal cell carcinoma and a cable thrombus. And you can see it's stuck in there right here to the renal vein and kind of coming around that and excising the renal vein there. But it can uh, and has been done. And again, I think it probably represents the most complex uh, of what we do. Here, the open, the vein is open and then ready to be sewn. And it's clamped above and below. And you can see in the prior video, the large lumbar veins. And here is a post-closure using an ultrasound to make sure there's flow and no residual thrombus. Um, but again, th this is kind of a, a far cry from just a simple laparoscopic nephrectomy. And I think we've come as a field a long, long way. Last thing I want to show you here is a robotic uh, RPLND. Dr. Meng has done his, these. Uh, this isn't something I do, but laparoscopically and robotically. And I think this represents probably one of the most challenging things that we can do. But I do think that the robot is a is a great instrument for this. You can see the pre-cable and inter cable nodes, very clean and falling, falling all the way down the, the cord there. Um, the, yeah, it represents really the, the most, some of the most challenging things of, of what we can do. This is obviously very challenging. We see here a lot of uh, post-chemo RPLNDs, which is a different situation, but I think in the native RPLNDs, this works well. And you can, do, you can see a nice nerve sparing uh, procedure there as well. I'll move us along here and just finish up and be happy to answer any questions. I think we are seeing the application, the technology and how we apply this continue to advance. I do believe that there's a need for competition. There are other robotic manufacturers that are out there. Uh, they're, they're in different specialties, they're in orthopedics, they're using in bronchoscopy, but we really need one for the intra-abdominal uh, to, to, you know, competition certainly brings down cost and, and spurs innovation. I would like to see better uh, formats for education and training. Simulators exist, but really not on the level of that they have, say, in flight. Um, can you sit, truly simulate an operation 10 times for a resident or for somebody new, uh, you should be able to, but we really haven't gotten there yet. They still re remain somewhat rudimentary. Um, also the concept uh, of video coaching or even using AI to help you improve along the way. There's a concept that, you know, we all can need coaching. I need coaching, all of us do. Um, Roger Federer has a coach. Uh, so, like, shouldn't we keep getting better? I always think it's very valuable for me when I go back and look at videos that process that I showed you in, in the fast forward was actually from yesterday. And I kind of looked at it last night and just looking at the steps of it, it, it makes me think of what, what I can do better. So we could coach ourselves and certainly have external coaches. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to better use of imaging overlay and real-time imaging, whether that be PSMA PET or other things or for kidney tumors. Uh, CT scan or MRI. I think the next step as far as taking things like the SP technology, is there a potential role for notes, robotic notes? So that's natural orifice tra uh, transluminal endoscopic surgery. I mean, we do that already in urology, right, with cystoscopy and ureteroscopy. Uh, 
people have looked at robotic ureteroscopy as their role for that. Um, I'm very excited about the SP technology. I, I think it's more than just cosmesis and a gimmick. I do think it has real potential advantages doing a patient in supine position, uh, extra peritoneal and working in very small spaces, maybe for retroperitoneal kidney surgery. I know Dr. Meng has done that, I think has, has a lot of potential benefit. I do want to thank, this is a list of some of our, our trainees uh, who have really helped me, like not just put this stuff together, but early on, I think we were up to about 50 cases. Every case we were, we were brainstorming and troubleshooting what we did. And I, I thank all of these people for uh, helping me kind of grow also and figuring that out. This is my email address. If anybody has any questions or more information they want from me, if they want videos or anything, feel free to reach out to me directly and I'm happy to uh, uh, share and discuss these steps. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Raj. Well, it's, it, it is amazing how far we've come in 20 years. I still remember when I was Marshall's fellow 20 years ago, doing all of that pure laparoscopic. We got through it, but it was a struggle. Marshall can attest to that. Um, I had two quick questions, right? I mean, I think you brought up a little bit the teaching thing and just how are we, you know, like intracorporeal urinary diversion of whatever sort is really, really hard. And, you know, obviously it's just a systematic stepwise approach. Number one, how, how can we better disseminate and teach that? Because it's going to be a steep learning curve. And my second question would be, I'm looking at the list of uh, people on, and, you know, we have a lot of experienced multi-port XI people what's the leap going to be to SP? Is it worth it or not worth it? And, you know, how, how are we going to do that? Yeah, so the first, I think you're right, as far as how do you do, say, an intercorporeal diversion or any complex multi-port case? And I think it's, it's, as you say, it's breaking it down in steps. And I think how you approach it should be very stepwise too. Um, get your robotic cystectomy done first and get that learning curve under your belt. And even with that, I would tend to recommend starting with male patients first because we're used to the male pelvic robotic anatomy from prostate. So then transfer that over and then female. So get that, get that down and then the lymphadenectomy down before undertaking the diversion. The first diversion I did was in a patient who needed a simple cystectomy. So we did a super trigonal and we're able to dedicate more time to it. It does, it does require more time um, I'm not sure intracorporeal neobladders are worth it, having done them. Um, I don't think the time is worth it for the patient. But I think, as you say, just sort of overcome stepwise learning curves. And even if in that intracorporeal, you do part of it intracorporeally, and then you make a small incision and do the rest of it, I would recommend doing maybe the ureteroenteric anastomosis intracorporeally first, because that's where you're going to get the benefit, because that's doing the, that anastomosis without mobilizing the ureters and causing a potentially stricture. So I think there's benefit to doing that part. And then you could do the bowel work outside. So you just take your loop of bowel, connect the ureters in it, and then make an incision and divide the bowel and so forth. Um, as far as your second question, is the SP worth it? Trust me, I asked myself that question when, uh, when I started and started doing it, you know, having just you know, gotten all that down and, and uh, the multi-port down and there was a lot going on here. I was a, a you know, new chair and had a lot on my plate, but it's, I, I do think it is, I think there are benefits and I've really enjoyed again with our trainees kind of overcoming that learning curve a little bit. It's different. It's not a freebie. It's not going SI to XI by any stretch, but I do think that there are advantages maybe for retroperitoneal surgery and for the prostate. And I know you've had a chance to do uh, a kidney. What are your thoughts on it? It's different. I think it was maybe harder in a real patient compared to the training and simulators and all of that. So it is much more of a leap. And so we'll have to figure out how and where best to apply that. Yeah, that's true. And I think, I think uh, the sewing part, like you do in a prostate, the anastomosis is, is probably the trickier part because, again, you don't have that rest. Great. I think well, it's thank it. you so much, Raj. Um, and I think, you know, we're a little behind, but we'll just keep on moving along. Uh, Larry is doing an emergency case, so he's going to come back hopefully after uh, Mike and Hillary speak. So I think we're going to move on to Dr. Uh, Mike DeSandro, who's going to talk about pediatric urologic emergencies. So let me share my screen here.
Um, oops. So this isn't going to be quite as deep and intellectual as the last few talks we've heard. It's basically a primer, so kind of pediatric urology 101. Um, geared towards non-pediatric urologists so that you guys can um, take care of these patients and not be afraid. It's not very hard. Um, and I'll go through some examples um, in the next few minutes. So the big three um, is the acute scrotum, um, phimosis, and paraphimosis. So that's, I'd say, as far as us attendings going in to the hospital. Uh, for emergent surgery, uh, it's pretty much 90% of the time for the acute scrotum, and we'll talk about the other 10%, which happens every now and then, but um, the acute scrotum is the big one. Paraphimosis and phimosis, we can pretty much deal with in the ED most of the time. Um, so we'll start with the acute scrotum. There are several things that can cause an acute scrotum. Um, the most worrisome, um, but not the most common, is torsion of the testes itself or torsion of the spermatic cord. Um, on the right-hand column, I put what to do. So this is all, this is why it's a lot simpler than the last few talks we heard. Um, it's basically one word for each, each uh, solution. Uh, so it's very straightforward and it's not super scary. Um, so torsion of the, the, the testes, spermatic cord, you're going to do surgery, right? So you have, a, you have a short window of time after the testes torses um, before it's, it, it infarcts completely and, and, and has no turning back. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. Um, the other two, torsion of appendix testes and appendix epididymis aren't um, emergencies and they resolve on their own. Um, and those patients you can just observe and do not, they do not need surgery. Sometimes you'll end up doing surgery, and, and I'll show you a picture, but sometimes you'll end up doing surgery on torsion of the appendix testes, thinking it's torsion of the testes, but that's fine every now and then. Um, you're gonna have to do that so you don't miss the occasional um, torse testes. And then the final uh, big one is epididymitis architis, and that's very similar to adults. Um, basically, uh, we do urine culture, check for their voiding symptoms, check to see if they have any voiding symptoms, and plus minus antibiotics, depending on their age. Um, whether they're teenagers, sexually active, things like that. But again, usually not an emergency unless it's like an abscess or something more worrisome. Um, whoops. Okay. So the next uh, few things uh, are patients that can come to the ED every now and then, but um, usually it's not dealt by urology and the ED docs can handle it or pediatric surgeons in the case of incarcerated hernias. But if you do have an incarcerated inguinal hernia, um, pretty much the first step is try to reduce it in the, in the ED with some sedation um, and a little bit of massage. And most of the time you can do that unless it's really, really incarcerated. If it's really incarcerated and you can't reduce it, uh, then you do have to bring them to surgery. Some patients will show up with communicating hydrocele, so um, they'll have this big kind of dilated testicle that uh, scrotum that freaks them out. So the parents will bring them in, and then they lay down and then they're relaxed, and it goes away. Um, so that's kind of a communicating hydrocele, which is a form of hernia. It's just a patent process is vaginalis that's not big enough to allow uh, omentum or, or intestines to go down there, but it does allow peritoneal fluid to go back and forth. But those kids, you do not have to do anything urgently. They can just be observed. Non-communicating hydrocele's can be scary too to kids uh, when they have these big giant, just like an adult's big giant scrotums and they can get pretty huge. Um, the only caveat to non-communicating hydrocele's is that if a teenager comes in with a big giant hydrocele and you can't palpate the testes, it's probably advisable to get a, an ultrasound, a scrotal ultrasound um, at the time they're in the ED because sometimes you can have a reactive hydrocele from something bad like a testes tumor. Um, Varicoceles can sometimes cause discomfort um, that makes kids go to the ED, but those obviously we can just observe. A um, few more things. Um, trauma. Um, we are pretty conservative with treating testicular trauma unless the tunica is wide open and on the ultrasound you can see uh, spillage of the intratesticular contents outside the tunica. Um, 
but otherwise you can watch even with kind of a little tiny leak or a little tiny, which you think might, you know, if it's not hugely broken open, you can kind of sometimes observe them as well. Um, otherwise you have to bring them to the operating room kind of right away and sew it up just like an adult. Um, rashes, dermatologic lesions, uh, you will see all the time, but normally dermatology or the ED can deal with it. The more common thing that we get called for a lot is edema uh, or insect bites, insect bites. So it's either some kind of reaction um, uh, to the scrotum and the penile foreskin and it gets hugely dilated um, or sometimes just idiopathic edema or some kids who have edema from other medical uh, conditions can get this. But the bottom line is it always looks terrible. It looks big and swollen, but um, as long as the kids can void, uh, you don't have to do anything except antihistamines, topical or oral. Um, if they can't void, sometimes you have to put a catheter in, but most of the time they can void around the big uh, edema. Testes tumors, um, some kids will show up to the ED with that, um, and that does not need to be taken care of in the ED, obviously, but they should come, up, come to clinic the next day uh, to be taken care of quickly. Um, so you can see a lot of things happen in testes in kids, um, but testes torsion is by far the most uh, worrisome and the most emergent um, that we deal with uh, in the emergency room. So uh, testes torsion has pretty defined history, way it presents acute onset of pain, swelling and redness. Sometimes the patients can name the exact time it started. Um, and it's not, it's kind of unrelenting and they require narcotics in the emergency room. Uh, it's associated with nausea and vomiting um, if they're younger and younger kids can get uh, torsion prepubescent, but it, it, and the symptoms can be a little bit trickier in younger kids because they kind of have referred pain to the groin or abdomen or not really specifically point to the testes itself. Um, so um, you still, you have to be worried if you see a prepubescent kid who's having acute onset of groin pain or abdominal pain, and then you examine them, there's a little redness to their scrotum, it could be torsion. Usually they do not have voiding symptoms, um, as opposed to epididymitis, where sometimes they can. They'll have the famous high riding testes, absent cremasteric reflex, and it's pretty obvious they have a big red swollen testes that's super tender um, in the ED. Um, so you're going to always do an emergent scrotal ultrasound. If you're pretty sure clinically, you're going to book the case and then you're going to do the ultrasound while you're uh, while they're getting the room ready. So here's what the ultrasound would look like. Uh, this is a person who does not have torsion. So you can see nice uh, blue and red. So this is a Doppler and you can see good blood flow, good arterial and venous blood flow on both testes. Um, here is the Doppler of a kid who does have torsion. So on the left testy, so you can see again, blood flow, blue, red, nice Doppler here, and then nothing here, a little blood vessel around the outside of the testes, but the testes itself is, uh, has no flow at all. Um, ultrasound, just to make a point, is super, super specific, and the sensitivity is getting better and better, I swear, like every day um, with our new machines. So, um, you, we really, really rely on it much more than we used to, just even 10 years ago when it was more of a clinical um, diagnosis and we kind of got the ultrasound to confirm it. Now ultrasound is so sensitive and specific that um, we rely on it even if the clinical symptoms aren't um, perfect. So um, if the, let's say they, the pain was slow onset and it's not super red or swollen, but if you have a, a positive scrotal ultrasound, meaning there's no blood flow, um, it's not, you know, 1% false positive rate. So you're going to take that child to this, to the operating room immediately. Um, sensitivity isn't quite as good, but we have other things now that are kind of increasing sensitivity of, of the ultrasound. Um, cause these ultrasounds are, like I said, so sensitive and so good now that, um, there's a whirlpool sign. So let's say there's a, you know, it looks like there's a little bit decreased flow in the testes on Doppler, but then you have this associated whirlpool sign that increases the sensitivity a lot. And you can see it here. It looks, looks like a whirlpool, right? So here's, these are, the, these are the blood vessels kind of twisting around themselves in the cord. And believe it or not, you can actually see this. Um, it seems like it's kind of magic, but it, it, when you see these in real life, it's pretty obvious. So whirlpool sign with a little bit of low flow, you're going to take those guys to the OR. Um, you could 
do manual detorsion while you're waiting to go up to the operating room. It's not a permanent solution, but it does resolve the pain a lot of times. And it could give you an extra half hour or so by the time you get, you know, by the time you open the scrotum. It's, as you guys all remember, it's like opening a book. Um, so medial to lateral. And uh, believe it or not, it's actually, you can do it with some sedation. The kids are on so much, so much pain medicine that it doesn't really bother them too much. Um, and then they're so happy that the pain is relieved. So it's kind of, you don't have to do it, but it is kind of nice to, um, if, if you can, to give it a try. A few words on technically what needs to be done so that, because um, there's a few kind of things that come up uh, when we're doing uh, testes torsion. So bottom line is you just detorse the testes, you untwist it, um, leave it there for a minute with maybe some warm compresses, and then you're going to do the other side because we always pex both sides, right? So um, while you're doing the other side, uh, you wait to see how the testes looks after a few minutes. Um, my thought is even if there's a minuscule amount of uh, pinkness uh, that comes back, I would leave the testes in. Um, otherwise, you can if it's completely black and kind of mushy, you just take it out. Um, I've never had, you know, people kind of laugh at me for leaving these dead testicles in, but I've never had um, issues with having to go back and take them out later. Um, and they do leave a, a little, even if they atrophy, they leave a little cosmetic um, testes in the scrotum, which the patients seem to like to have something, something in their scrotum. And interestingly, they don't, they usually don't atrophy completely and disappear um, if they have a little bit of pinkness to them. Um, like I said, either way, the contralateral side needs to be pexed. We use absorbable sutures. So example of 5 pds um, it'll scar down eventually after that dissolves and, and there's no increased recurrence rate with using absorbable and then they don't have a stitch in the scrotum the rest of their lives. Uh, key technique is you must open the tunica completely uh, and push it out of the way, kind of behind the testicle so that um, you're not sewing the tunica of the testes back to it, its own its own tunica because then it can twist again in the future. So you push the tunica all the way behind the testes and then you pex the testes to the actual dartos um, so that it, it won't twist. So you're moving, you're going to open the tunica completely and move it out of the way. And they can usually go home the same day. So here's uh, some examples. Um, the one on the right, you'd obviously leave in. That looks like a nice, healthy testes. The one on top, if you look closely, you can see a little bit of this, what I'm talking about, this little kind of pink stuff here. And if you, when you first untwist it, if this little pink stuff gets pinker, then I would leave it in. And also, you know, if the testes has a little firmness to it, it's not a big um, blob of kind of just dried out blood. Um, so a testes like this, you might consider leaving in. Um, and then if you untwist it and it looks relatively, you know, blue and it turns pink, um, those are good ones to leave in as well. The other thing you have to mention that we have to mention is that intermittent testicular torsion. So when it's intermittent, it's a little trickier, trickier. So patients can come to the emergency room with the history I was talking about. They lay down, they get their ultrasound and boom, the pain's gone. Um, you do the ultrasound and it shows good flow or maybe a tiny bit uh, less flow. And you're like, well, it was probably torsion, maybe it untorsed with the ultrasound, or maybe it wasn't, maybe it was only torsed to, you know, 360 instead of 720. Um, so if they have a normal ultrasound, but the history is a lot like testes torsion and they had redness and swelling, it's not just pain. They have to have kind of everything that goes along with it, redness, swelling, maybe nausea and vomiting that goes away. Then that I would say is intermittent testicular torsion. And you don't need to pex those guys the same day, but you should do it semi urgently. Usually we do it the next week, at some point with, you know, strict ED recall, um, guidelines. The other thing you'll see um, it, with regards to test testes torsion is neonatal testes torsion. So um, this is kind of a whole different beast in itself. Um, it's because it's extra vaginal. So um, the entire tunica twists around itself, not the testes within the tunica. So when the whole tunica is twisting around itself, it's not good. And so it's normally impossible to save these testes by untwisting them. Um, but um, we do tend to still take them to surgery, usually semi-urgently like the next day or the next couple of days um, to pex the other testes. It's somewhat controversial. I never used to do it, um, but now it's kind of the general consensus that uh, 
you know, one testee is a little bit higher risk, maybe, of torsing that remaining testes, um, and also medical legal constraints and worries uh, mean that we usually PEX the other one semi-electively and then remove the um, neonatal testes that twisted. A lot of times those neonatal torsions will show up. This is kind of an obvious one. They show up with a big squ squirrel, squirrel swelling, but a lot of times they'll just show up with a little nub end or a little redness or tenderness because it, it, it torsed prenatally. Um, and by the time the baby's born, it's kind of already resolving. Um, those kids, you still might want to take to surgery. Um, and to me, that's why it's somewhat debatable why we don't take kids who have prenatal torsion to surgery immediately, but we take these kids um, who, you know, twist the day or two after, sur after they're born to surgery. But, all right. The other thing that you see in usually in prepubescent pre kids is torsion of the appendix testes. Um, this is the epididymis, the testes, we all know this, and then the appendix epididymis and appendix testes hang off here. Um, it's usually prepubertal kids. Uh, it's a more insidious onset, like they'll get slow pain, they kind of walk funny, they don't usually get nausea or vomiting, but it can get big and red and swollen and look just like torsion. If you're lucky and you catch them early, you can see this blue dot sign, uh, which is the appendix torsed and infarcted. Um, and Usually kids with fair skin or moderately fair skin, you can see this if you see them right away, but they usually don't come in at this stage. They usually come in a few days after it starts because then it starts to get red and swollen and reactive, and that's when the parents notice it. And here's an interoperative picture just from a recent case um, of a torsed um, appendix, looks like appendix epididymis, um, but it could be appendix testes, but one of the appendices uh, torsed. All right, so that's the testes. Next is phimosis. Um, and that's not my dog, I, I found that on the internet. <laughs> the um, phimosis, we all know what phimosis is, common in adults as well. In kids, it can look really bad, just like in an adult, and they can have trouble um, voiding. And so that's the main worry with phimosis in children is that they can't void. So rarely, I mean, I think in the you know, past 20 years, I've had to go to surgery or do a dorsal slit in a child a couple times uh, for retention. They usually can void eventually. Um, sometimes they'll go into retention with a tight hole because it hurts to void. And so they're, you know, they're young, like a seven-year-old, and they're scared to pee and they hold it in. But then the bladder gets so big and distended that the pain of urinary retention overcomes the pain of the phimosis or the irritation and they eventually go. So most kids, unless it's completely closed, can void. Um, but if not, then you do have to do a dorsal slit um, or, it, or just bring them to the operating room and do the circumcision. Sometimes it's easier on kids just to do that rather than the sedation and local and all that stuff like you do in an adult. Um, other, otherwise, you use cream, just we just try and sell on cream and that loosens it up actually pretty quickly. Um, so uh, that would be the next step. Other problems with phimosis are not the phimosis itself, but complications after uh, circumcision. So this we do get a lot. Um, the way that um, patient, uh, way that uh, other physicians and patient and uh, actually Moyles uh, do circumcisions uh, lead to different types of compl complications. So um, Moyles and some pediatricians tend to use a Mogan clamp, which is just kind of like a, a guillotine type uh, clamp that can sometimes damage the glands or uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have that much pressure uh, against the, like where the skin hits the uh, skin of the gland. So it sometimes can fall apart and bleed. Um, the most common way that pediatricians uh, do circumcisions and the way we do it on newborns as well is with a plastibel ring. Unfortunately, the, one of the complications with the ring is it gets stuck on. Stuck on, so you'll see this in the emergency room. Um, the, it's annoying. I've never seen any necrosis to the glands, so that's it's not a huge issue that you have to worry about necrosis to the glands. I guess it could happen, but it's not going to come off on its own. So you you know you got to do something. Um, you can use a little ring cutter. Um, you know, for kids who have uh, rings stuck on their fingers, it kind of there's a little part of it slips under here uh, and the other part has a circle so it kind of protects the skin underneath uh, by the circular blade that spins or you can use a cast cutter which sometimes even works better especially in an older kid 
because it vibrates. So that doesn't really hurt the skin underneath and it actually can cut through the plaster bell. Um, if you have sloughing of the skin or glands that you have to take them to the, uh, usually have to take them to the operating room to clean it all out. And sometimes if they come in with a little piece of the tissue, you can reattach it as well. All right, so next is parathymosis. And that's very uh, similar to adults. Um, so you're gonna treat that the same way. Uh, you can do it in the ED, just like in adults. Uh, we squeeze the fluid, um, give them some sedation and a little penile block. Uh, and then you can kind of uh, just go for it. And 99% of the time you can do this um, in the ED, even in, even in a child. Uh, penile tumors are rare. But this isn't the penile tumor, but we get called for this all the time. So I thought I'd throw it in. It's just a little piece of smegma stuck under the foreskin. And those come out by themselves. And not to be um, whoops, gender centric and only talk about boys, but girls have some uh, emergent uh, genital issues too. That, and this is the most common thing we'll see in a girl is urethral prolapse. Um, it's very obvious when you see it. It always kind of looks like this um, with kind of the... Uh, curly kind of cranberry looking uh, tissue that spots blood onto the, either their diaper or their underwear if they're a little bit older. Um, that you normally do not need to do surgery for even though they're scary looking and, and bleed, can bleed a lot. Um, you'd normally just treat them with Premarin cream 625 for about three weeks and usually it resolves on its own. If it doesn't resolve after that you can try some try them some lone cream steroid cream as well. Um, but those are not usually surgical emergencies. Um, High-risk emergencies. So we have to mention these because the other stuff is, you know, we'd save a testes, it's great. We can, you know, um, save a penis, it's great, but we don't, we want to try and save lives too. So these are the, the life, life or death type situations in pediatric urology that really, really need to be uh, dealt with immediately and carefully and well. So the big one is perforation of augmentation cystoplasty. So this would mostly be in a spina bifida child uh, who had an augmentation cystoplasty, usually with ileum, um, and they uh, do perforate. So um, if you're lucky, it'll be a small little leak um, at the anastomosis, and it can be kind of controlled um, you know, without the patient getting too sick, but sometimes they get a big hole um, and they leak a lot of urine. Usually it's older kids. If they're not cathing correctly, the bladder gets too full um, and they leak. And the thing is they get sick very quickly. So they get septic, they get peritoneal signs um, and they will die if you don't treat them immediately. And I've had several, several, I'd say, yeah, more than two or three patients who died from perforated augmentation cystoplasty. So um, if any patient with spina bifida and augment comes in with peritoneal signs, uh, you've got to work them up immediately with CT scan, um, you know, pre and post contrast in the bladder, uh, or take them to the operating room immediately as if they're sick and just assume it's uh, ruptured. Um, the other thing, just like adults, is sepsis from obstruction. Um, and adults, usually it's from stones or some acquired um, problem, but in kids, it can be from congenital issues like ectopic ureters or ureteral seals, uh, posterior urethral valve, stuff like that. So it's, but, it, but it's the same treatment as in adults. You still want to immediately uh, relieve the obstruction. So, um, you know, it, it, we put a stent in for kids, so it's just like you would an adult. And if it's something um, uh, in ureter wise or a congenital problem, you could do a percutaneous nephrostomy or you can bring the ureter out to the skin, a cutaneous ureterostomy. Um, it's a ureter seal, you can puncture it. So bottom line is you wanna uh, relieve the obstruction immediately. Same thing with renal failure. We have kids who come in very sick and you can die from renal failure from obstruction as well. Um, severe trauma is treated very similarly to adults, so we won't talk too much about trauma. Um, and finally, um, the uh, rest of the kind of uh, rest of the emergencies we see are not super different from adult, so uh, they're not scary if you just kind of think of how you would treat it in an adult. So GU trauma is very similar. We're very conservative with renal uh, trauma, just as in adults. Um, we have our colleagues um, 
at Parnassus, um, Max and Lindsay mainly, who can help us with um, tricky uh, renal trauma situations. Um, and we use them all the time. Um, priapism happens quite often. Usually it's almost always with uh, sickle cell anemia children. Um, so we treat the sickle cell anemia first uh, with good hydration and possibly um, transplant, sorry, sorry, possibly transfusions, uh, high, I'm sorry, oxygen, and we try medical treatment, and then we go to the uh, um, uh, intracorporeal uh, medical treatments, irrigations, and stuff like that. So similar to adults. Um, most of the time you have to do it in the operating room though, uh, unlike adults where you can do it in the emergency room if you needed to do some, something like irrigations or um, a shunt. Um, obstruction, we talked about posterior urethral valves is urgent, but usually they don't show up to the emergency room. Usually you know that about it prenatally, but sometimes um, um, you don't know if the patient has poor prenatal care and they'll show up kind of in, in renal failure right after they're born. Um, ureter seals, ectopic ureters, we, we talked about as well. That you need to divert those um, if they're septic. If they're not septic and they are the kidneys normal, nothing needs to be done urgently. It can wait, it can wait um, a bit. And then ural urolithiasis is the same. If there's uh, bacteria behind it and the, ki and the kid's getting sick, you're going to have to do something about it. Luckily, we have all, we have stents that can fit patients from infant uh, to adult size. So, and we have scopes that easily go through urethras of um, infant to adult size. So uh, we can put stents in pretty much any child. So that would be the same as an adult. The difference is your ureteroscopy or taking the stone out um, at the same time would not be technically feasible in a, a young child. Um, normally the ure ureter has to dilate up with a stent first before we can get any instruments um, into the ureter. But normally when they're septic, you're, you're not dealing that with that anyway, even in an adult. All right, so that's it. Bottom line is it's not super tricky um, and adult urologists can do it. So thanks. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, and I apologize to everybody, we're a little over time, so we will probably roll into the breakout session. So we built that in a little bit. Mike, one quick question. Clearly with the increased accuracy of ultrasound for torsion, uh, provider performed, radiology performed, both acceptable. What, what do you guys tend to do and what's sort of best practice? Sorry, I missed the last part. Of, I... uh, provider perform, you know, point of care by the urologist, radiology, do you, does it matter? What's, what's sort of the best way to do the ultrasound if you're concerned about torsion? No, it needs to be, yeah. We wouldn't do it in our office. We wouldn't rely on anybody else. It needs to be the technician in the hospital who's got, you know, great experience doing these and the radiologists, uh, you know, at home. <laughs> was yeah. but, okay. Um, but not point of care necessarily, or probably not, not, you know, we should have radiology, technician, formal. Yeah. And the other, yep. And the other reason Max is because medical legally. So, uh, you know, it, it, these, this is the most, one of the most common reasons pediatric urologists are sued. Uh, is missed torsion or not operating on torsion quickly enough. Correct. So we need, you know, to have to say we've had the expert, the best in the hospital doing the ultrasound. Yep. That wouldn't be yep. Good. I just wanted to make that clear. Great. Thanks, Mike. I'll have Hillary then, what sort of the limits of patient size in the pediatric population due to either reduced surface area on the outside or interior volume that you, you don't think the robot's so good for? Yeah, Max, that's a great question. Um, I, I think generally we're fairly comfortable, you know, most of the time in these situations, we're waiting till about three months of age anyways, and that has to do with if the patient's stable, uh, anesthesia risks, having to stay overnight um, to monitor, um, you know, just higher incidence of reversing things that have um, after birth um, kind of changed physiologically. So we tend to wait in general till after three months, but size-wise, really, we're not limited. Um, we go, certainly operate on patients from three to six months of age with the robot and find that there's plenty of working room. Done less with the XI, but I anticipate um, not you know, having any, as far as with smaller sized children, but probably not having any um, additional difficulties with that age group either. <laughs> 
probably almost in some ways easier with the XI, just less clashing on the exterior and just ergonomically, right. even on the right. small patient. Agreed. Yeah. We, we have, you know, we're using the XI because we don't have a choice now, uh, as you know, Max, but um, I think it's really kind of helped with a distal uterectomy. I am like completely frozen and think I'm going to have to stop my com or restart my computer. <laughs> so I apologize. Wait, that's okay, Larry. Um, but, um, should we move on to, I mean, let's have you, to we'll move on to Hillary and then we'll sort you out and then we can finish up. Perfect. That'd be great. Sorry about that. Th thanks. Thanks, you guys. No problem. Great. So um, we will move on to Dr. Hillary Kopp's talk and what's hot and not in pediatric urology. All right. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Well, thanks again for uh, joining us today. And um, I'm excited to talk about some of the things that we're doing um, as a division um, in pediatric urology. And I'm gonna focus on sort of three main, uh, three main areas uh, that make UCSF pediatric urology um, a standout uh, destination for pediatric urology care. Um, and I think really put us at the cutting edge of providing uh, premier care to our patients. And those three main uh, areas are uh, bench to bedside practice that we have, uh, the, some of the clinical innovations um, that we're, we are doing. And then also I'm gonna talk about the multidisciplinary care clinics that we have. So first with bench to bedside, um, uh, I think a part of, uh, we're all actively engaged in research and something that is very fulfilling to us is seeing our research um, in, uh, directly affect our, our clinical practice and also involving um, teaching with our residents and, and working with our residents and fellows in our research. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the things um, that each of us have done and first starting off with um, a project that both uh, Dr. Baskin and I did together with some uh, one of our uh, outstanding um, former medical students who's now a resident down at UCLA, Tom Gaither. Um, bladder and bowel dysfunction, as everybody knows, is um, a very big problem in the pediatric population and underdiagnosed and significantly contributes to the recurrent urinary tract infection rate and also affects um, uh, spontaneous resolution of vesicourethral reflux and our surgical outcomes. So uh, very important. What's interesting is that we are really just beginning to understand bladder and bowel dysfunction and don't have a great understanding as to um, why some children get it. Um, and in this study, we were able to do a secondary data analysis of some very robust data from the uh, RIVER trial, which is the randomized intervention for vesicourethral reflux trial and NIH-sponsored um, uh, trial in children with vesicourethral re uh, reflux and the effectiveness of antibiotic prophylaxis. There's also uh, an arm uh, or a separate study called the QD trial where patients were screened to enter into the river trial. Um, but uh, if they did not have a vesicourethral reflux, they were um, followed in the same fashion that those uh, that did have vesicourethral reflux were. So we looked at these two patient populations to assess, um, since it was prospective, to assess for their development of bladder and bowel dysfunction. What we found is that 35% of these children uh, that were presenting with prior UTI had bladder and bowel dysfunction. So a third of, over a third of patients with UTI have this diagnosis, very common. And we found that risk factors for bladder and bowel dysfunction were female sex, so a 12-fold higher odds, and then dilating vesicourethral reflux, which is 2.2-fold higher odds. Um, and this, these um, two findings have, um, in, or three findings have impact on our clinical practice and such that we always screen patients for bladder and bowel dysfunction that have um, urinary tract infection treated aggressively. We know to look for it um, in female patients. It's more common, although males can get it. And then also uh, in children that we're managing earlier on with high grade reflux, that's something that we're paying attention to as they age. So, Antibiotic prophylaxis is certainly effective. We know that from the RIVER trial, it decreased the recurrent urinary tract infection rate um, by 50%, but uh, it can come at a cost. And so something that um, uh, 
we wanted to look at was what is the uropathogen resistance um, among patients managed on antibiotic prophylaxis. The literature previously um, really focused on what um, resistance was to the antibiotic prophylactic agent. Um, we used the opportunity to, uh, of all of the prior randomized controlled trials to answer a, a bigger question that it potentially affects our ability to manage patients um, on prophylaxis effectively, which is multi-drug resistance. And that's, you know, where uh, this has significant implications for when patients have recurrent urinary tract infections on prophylaxis. And what we found was that prophylaxis does in fact in, uh, increase multi-drug resistance by a six-fold odds. And very interestingly, the number needed uh, to treat to prevent one UTI is 21, but similarly for every 21 children treated, one will have a multi-drug resistant urinary tract infection. So these findings have important implications for us as we think about um, putting patients on antibiotic prophylaxis. And certainly there's a risk benefit ratio that we need to consider. Also, we know that prophylaxis is only as good as if you take it. So um, there are certainly uh, implications um, uh, for its effectiveness based on adherence. Uh, some prior work that uh, I've I, uh, done while I was a fellow at Stanford, we looked at um, adherence among patients with vesicoureteral reflux, and it's extremely poor um, um, on, uh, in taking antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, so we decided to look again at patients within the river trial and um, get a better understanding since adherence data was collected um, on these patients, get a better understanding of how this associated with the uh, outcomes. First of all, BBD comes up again and we found that it's a predictor for non-adherence. And so this patient population that we're extremely worried about already at baseline when, we, when you're putting them on prophylaxis, they're at higher risk for non-adherence. We also found that those patients that were non-adherent had an increased risk for renal scarring. And then also those who were most adherent to prophylaxis actually had an increased risk for renal scarring. And this finding is, is um, concerning because it potentially has to do with how this alters um, your organism if you have a recurrent urinary tract infection and perhaps um, uh, changes the effectiveness of our, of our treatment because of the fact that there's, um, you're more likely to have a resistant UTI. This clearly needs to be further studied. A fun study that we um, recently published uh, uh, was uh, a based on a secret shopper survey of California pharmacies. And uh, again, in our interest of understanding the implications of our prescribing patterns, um, we, we felt that um, uh, it, surveying pharmacies um, was a good idea because they're in an ideal position to provide disposal information. And in talking with our patients, we felt like they often had leftover medications, including antibiotics and opioids, and were really unsure of how to dispose of them. Uh, so six of us um, followed a script and called a randomized sample of California pharmacies to ask them um, what we should do as a parent with our leftover medications after our children had surgery. And those medications included an opioid and an antibiotic. And what's interesting is that less than 50% of pharmacies surveyed actually provided correct disposal information. And only one in 10 pharmacies had take back programs at their location. So um, we think that this is uh, highlights an excellent opportunity for us to um, it, uh, you know, improve the quality of care to our patients and um, make it easier for patients to take back their medications. We also try to do a better job of talking to patients uh, about how to dispose of any leftover medications. And then even one step above that is we try to limit the medications that we prescribe that we don't think they're ultimately going to need. So, um, I'm gonna head over to talking about some of the amazing work that Dr. Baskin does. Um, and uh, he um, does both clinical and uh, basic science research. And a lot of his research involves uh, using multiple techniques. He, um, and it, um, as far as basic uh, science, and he's involved many of the residents and fellows in his work and which has led to um, a number of uh, publications. He also does, a very impactful clinical work. And this is a recent um, publication that he and one of our residents, uh, Dr. De La Calle, uh, published um, that is a great resource for the pediatric urology community and beyond looking at 
uh, the diagnosis and treatment of intra-abdominal gonads in the pediatric population, and it reviews gonadal formation, common etiologies, diagnosis and management of intra-abdominal gonads in DSD, and um, talks about fertility potential and cancer uh, risk. Some other interesting work has to do with um, renal, uh, renal length um, in the setting of uh, uh, multicystic dysplastic kidney. And Dr. Baskin's hypothesis is that renal length measurements correlate with renal function. Um, he's done a lot of interesting work um, over the last uh, number of years with this. And um, what, what some highlights are that the majority of patients that have multicystic dysplastic kidneys will have contralateral hypertrophy typically around three years of age, and this helps with us in counseling our patients. Also, that the rate of multicystic dysplastic kidney involution uh, can predict contralateral kidney growth. And so these are uh, all things that we can use in our clinical practice. Dr. DeSandro has done some uh, interesting work with hypospadias and non-operative management of hypospadias. And one of these was a novel uh, Facebook study uh, that we all participated in um, to assess the natural history of untreated hypospadias. Um, this is a difficult problem to study because a lot of times these patients actually don't present um, and we don't have a lot of information on them. So Facebook was um, a great avenue to try to access this population. Um, and the main findings were that men with untreated hypospadias reported worse outcomes versus non-hypospadiac mean men, and that mild untreated hypospadias had fewer adverse outcomes versus those with severe hypospadias. Clearly, further research is needed uh, to determine if treatment of childhood hypospadias improves outcomes in adults. And that's going to sort of segue into some of the uh, innovative things that we're doing clinically which first off sort of stems from um, this uh, uh, work that Dr. DeSandro um, has spearheaded. And uh, now we're working on developing an observational hypospadias registry. So if you look here, the question is, you know, do all patients actually need surgery for their hypospadias? And uh, it seems maybe like it could be a straightforward question, but there are you know, a range of uh, ways, as we're all aware, that hypospadias can prevent from very minor, as you see to the left, where there's sort of a fake out uh, distal urethral pit with the meatus right below and probably has absolutely no clinical significant, significance to these, um, you know, slightly more severe, but still more or less normal appearing penises that likely have uh, no issues with urinary stream, but some foreskin abnormalities and maybe some curvature, and especially as you get closer uh, to the other end of uh, the spectrum. So we ask ourselves, well, what are the reasons that we recommend surgery? And um, of course, we're doing it because we want to um, improve outcomes, quality of life. Um, as, as a pediatric urologist, um, we have a patient, but the parent is making the decisions for that patient. And you know, the parents often want it. Um, if the child's older, is it because the child wants it? Uh, is it that the surgeon or the endocrinologist wants it? Are we doing it to preserve functional aspects of the anatomy? Are we doing it to help the child fit in better with society? And what does that really mean? Um, as I had alluded to earlier, there are really very little non-operative data. And again, it's because very few patients seek care for untreated hypospadias. And in fact, in the past, it's been quite rare to not have treatment as a child. So, we are, although we're surgeons and um, of course like to operate, I think um, one of the unique things that we're doing is forming a registry to actually follow these children um, who are undergoing watchful waiting. Um, so we're creating an observational registry uh, with starting with more, um, uh, you know, or less severe hypospadias, including distal hypospadias and mild forms of penile atypia. But in fact, anybody who's not interested in um, surgery uh, can be within the um, observation arm. So this is a prospective study with two groups, surgery versus watchful waiting. It's not changing our standard of care at all. Um, we still uh, offer surgery. It's, based, it's offering all of the options to the family and allowing them to decide and then following them prospectively. 
we'll be following them um, every six months until adulthood and assessing various outcomes, including psychosocial outcomes using validated measures and also doing digital photography to capture the change in the appearance over time. The next thing that we're doing that's uh, innovative is awake bladder Botox in children. And to an adult urologist, this sounds not very novel since it's done all the time in adults awake in clinic. Um, however, um, in children, it's typically, it typically um, has required anesthesia for various reasons. Um, first, as to back up, as you're all aware, you know, bladder Botox um, is used for overactive or high pressure bladders. It's often used in the spina bifida setting and can be a big game changer for various reasons. Um, it can help us avoid anticholinergic therapy where we don't necessarily have data about cognitive, cognitive decline as we do in adults, but that's something that we do worry about. There are also some patients that don't tolerate an, um, anticholinergic therapy. Um, and then um, sometimes uh, anticholinergic therapy just isn't effective and it's um, and bladder Botox is uh, something we can use to help avoid augmentation cystoplasty uh, that has significant long-term effects and short-term effects, uh, not only for um, the child with uh, quality of life issues, uh, intensity of management and potential outcomes. So if we can avoid uh, bladder augmentation or delay it, there's a significant benefit to that. Um, so again, uh, this is often applying to the spina bifida uh, population and generally in children, it's done under general anesthesia for multiple reasons. Um, children, often we think about not being able to tolerate procedures uh, awake, but in, in addition, the, uh, the needle required, um, you know, so when you have the setup for bladder Botox in pediatric patients, their urethra is small. So to use a flexible scope, it's a 17 French um, scope. Uh, and for many of our patients, um, not possible to use. Um, and so we would we use an offset 9.5 uh, scope that has a five French channel that allows the Williams needle to fit through. Um, we uh, were concerned that children wouldn't uh, tolerate this, especially male children with a rigid scope awake. Um, uh, but our hypothesis was that potentially there's a, at least a subset of children um, that could tolerate this. And we began um, doing intravesical Botox injection awake. Uh, to date, we have 17 patients that we've injected, actually a few more now that have a last analysis. Um, in addition, we were concerned that potentially uh, there were uh, children with behavioral issues or increased sens sensation um, or cognitive delay perhaps would not um, be able to tolerate uh, or less likely to tolerate awake Botox. And today we've injected 13 with anxiety or behavioral issues and nine with cognitive de uh, delay. We did have one patient that we converted to general anesthesia due to underlying anxiety and that has affected our practice going forward and that we can give um, and an oral benzodiazepam to those patients that we feel like in screening have a significant anxiety or a behavioral issue that would contribute to them not being able to tolerate awake Botox. So we do believe and know that awake Botox is feasible in patients with neurogenic bladder and um, have injected patients as young as four years old and even those with well-managed mental health issues or delay. Finally, I'd just like to highlight our multidisciplinary care that we have at UCSF um, and I think makes us a standout location. Um, and these clinics include spina bifida, differences in sex development and transitional urology. So our spina bifida clinic uh, is a twice monthly clinic and the services available include urology, PM&R, neurosurgery, orthopedics, nutrition, psychology, and social work. And this is um, some of us here, including uh, Dr. Hampson, who I'll speak about later, so, uh, co-directs the transitional urology um, program with me. But our, our key player here is Joyce Harvey. She's the nurse practitioner who um, runs our clinic and keeps us all in line. But um, this is one of my favorite parts about being a pediatric urologist. And I absolutely uh, love taking care of uh, this patient population. Um, and it's a, it's a, a, a an excellent service that we can provide with all of the different um, uh, care teams available to, to uh, help the entire um, picture of this uh, patient population that has complex issues. We also have a robust differences in sexual development clinic that's led by Dr. Baskin and our uh, uh, pediatric endocrinology colleagues. 
this clinic meets uh, monthly um, and uh, has a, a case conference and um, the services involved include urology, endocrinology, genetics, psychiatry, and social work. And our goal is to provide um, holistic care in this clinic to pr present all of the options um, and help the parents in making an informed decision and um, the best decision for uh, the child. And then finally, our transitional urology clinic, which uh, Dr. Hampson and myself uh, uh, co-direct. We meet monthly. We have a care conference where we discuss all of uh, the patients. And um, the patients that we see include adults with uh, congenital conditions requiring long-term uh, genital urinary care. Uh, in addition to seeing these patients in clinic together, we uh, operate at least monthly together doing complex reconstructive cases in, among adults with congenital urologic conditions. And the cases that we perform range from uh, complex uh, redo hypospadias repair um, to uh, just um, two days ago, we did a um, excision of and reimplantation of an ectopic ureter going into um, the prostate. This was done robotically. And uh, we are really, um, not only is this clinic fulfilling for us, but I think it's really serving as a model for how to provide uh, long-term care for patients who have complex congenital issues. So in summary, um, UCSF Pediatric Urology offers um, bench to bedside practice, clinical innovation, and multidisciplinary care that makes us a, um, a premier destination for kids in the Bay Area, Northern California, and beyond. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Hillary. Um, and okay, yes. here's Hillary. Uh, shout out, and here's Max. And uh, slides are coming across nicely now. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So pyeloplasty is really uh, what we're doing the most of. Um, we're also dealing with ectopic ureters from ureteroceles uh, and um, uh, ectopic ureters and ureteroceles. And that's mostly really ablative surgery, although some reconstructive surgery. And then we're doing a bit, uh, mostly laparoscopy, but I'll show one robotic case of our patients with DSD and then the occasional uh, urethral anomaly and ureteral reimplant. I'm going to start off with pyeloplasty, as everybody's familiar with the UPJ. Um, recently, we've changed uh, our approach because we went from the SI to the XI. Uh, with the SI, we also were able to kind of triangulate and do this hide technique. But as I'll uh, subsequently talk about, nobody really cares about their scars. And um, one of the indications for robotic surgery, at least the main one for us, is I think it just uh, the kids recover quicker and certainly the teenagers. So here's an example of the most common type of UPJ issue we see, which is really an intrinsic obstruction. Um, the robot, just like laparoscopy, is really well suited for the dissection, but the advantage of the robot, um, as everybody knows, is really the sewing. Uh, here's an example of a large pelvis also with an intrinsic obstruction of the ureter kind of wrapped up uh, close to the pelvis. And again, the robot gives us incredible uh, visualization, even better than laparoscopy and really the ability to uh, dissect out. Here's an example of a duplex system uh, where the lower pole ureter is intrinsically going obviously to the lower pole of the kidney obstructed there. And you could saw that upper pole ureter uh, headed north. Here's an example of the second most common uh, type of situation we see, which is a crossing vessel. This is also a good demonstration of the transmesenteric approach. So essentially we're operating basically through the size, I would say of a silver dollar. And here's the uh, robot uh, uh, picking up the ureter. I guess it's actually us doing the work. Our patients always think we get a cup of coffee and the robot does the case. But you can see the nice crossing vessel uh, and the ureter here. And, uh, how this could cause pathology. So of course we, as opposed to dismembering the vessel, we just dismember the ureter. Um, here's another example of a great case. Reminds me of a case I did with Dr. Stoller many, many years ago, uh, where you clearly have hydronephrosis, but when you go in for the case, 
the ureter looks completely normal and you start wondering whether you're operating on the wrong side and you kind of get uh, a little bit sweaty. And then when you finally cut into the ureter, uh, lo and behold, a big polyp pops out. And um, that's really the third most common uh, type of uh, UPJ we see. Here's that same case. If you look up north, actually the UPJ is completely normal. And a little bit south, this was a patient who had multiple polyps. And the good news uh, was is when we removed the abnormal segment, we were just able to bridge the gap. Otherwise, it would have been a little bit complex. Uh, but robot, uh, very, very nice for this type of a situation. Uh, this is the classic maneuver, intrinsic, intrinsic obstruction, kind of a long segment, uh, especially at the ureter. I think the operation is done just like you do the open operation. You can see nicely the very thin intrinsic abnormality here. And then after a uh, nice spatulation, you can see that the ureter basically could be put at a nice dependent position in this abnormal area excised. So pretty much like we do the open operation with the only difference being we're going interperitoneal uh, as opposed to extraperitoneal. Um, and in the case of robotic surgery, we basically always leave a double J stent in. Here's another example on the right side, intrinsic obstruction. And this is basically illustrating that the right side, since we don't uh, use an assist port, it can be a little bit tricky sometimes for exposure. So in this case, you can see a hitch stitch here uh, pulling up the pelvis. The hitch stitch has some advantages and disadvantages. One disadvantage is you're kind of distorting your anatomy. So you have to make sure that uh, when you do your repair and you let everything go, it's going to kind of fit in nicely. But the clear advantage is, is that without the hitch stitch, it would be impossible to kind of work behind the liver and dissect out your UPJ. As I mentioned, we always put a stent in for our pyeloplasties, at least at UCSF. We do this antegrade. Um, where we've gotten into trouble is patients who have a concomitant mega ureter. Um, but in general, this has been a very smooth uh, process. You can confirm stent placement either by cystoscopy or by ultrasound. Uh, my approach is if things go well, we have not, uh, not been burned. Um, the way the stent goes in, as I think people know, is we use a 14-gauge angio cath, uh, and then the stent goes through there, then we guide it in. One trick is these are our large needle holders uh, that we would use uh, for other cases. We use the black diamonds for the pyeloplasty, but the black diamonds will completely destroy the stent uh, if you touch it, and these you can be a little less, a little softer and uh, allows uh, a lot more efficiency. I had mentioned um, scars and pyeloplasties uh, many years ago, kind of as a parting uh, clinic visit for an 18 year old who had done bilateral pyeloplasties as a baby. Her little, you know, one and a half inch scars had grown to about six, seven inches. And uh, I was impressed on how big these scars was. And I asked her if they bothered her and she said no, uh, which I thought was interesting. So we did a scar acceptance study, Katie Wang, one of our fellows, and we basically compared patients who had had open pyeloplasties or open reimplants. We measured their scars. We showed that their scars grow in would grow in time if they were basically over a centimeter and a half. And we compared them to our robotic and laparoscopic. We did a nice plastic surgery uh, patient survey. And the bottom line is people don't really care about their scars in any way or form. They just want their kidney fixed or their ureters fixed. So I think. It's nice to minimize scars, but in my mind, the main reason uh, to do robotic and minimally invasive surgery is, is to get, especially these older kids, back to school. And for the younger kids, uh, the parents can get back to work quicker. So there's just basically less morbidity. The scar thing, I think, should be way uh, lower down on the list. Well, what about complications? Um, Early on in our experience, we weren't using a transmesenteric approach, so I think we had more post-op ileus. With a transmesenteric approach, uh, this has basically gone away. We've had some stent issues where they're not in the bladder. The solution of that is to place another double J stent. Every once in a while, a needle pops off. Uh, Max, I'm sure, remembers a couple cases where he's come in and helped me. And one of the tricks here, if you lose a needle, is basically finish the case, de-dock, put the patient supine, 
and uh, we've had then success finding the needle. Uh, occasionally, we've taken an x-ray. Since we use 6-0 monocryl, I was told by management I could leave the needle in, but I can't imagine walking out to the family and said, oh, by the way, we left a needle in. And 6-0 um, monocryl shows up very nicely on an x-ray. Also, early in our experience, we've had uh, when our cases were longer, now they're about, I would say, two, two and a half hours. Uh, with about two hours of positioning, we had uh, a case of rhabdomyolysis, uh, cases that have gone too long. So you got to be super careful with your positioning since we use quite lateral position with a patient essentially hanging off the table. Haven't had to redo uh, any of the pyeloplasties, and um, I've had experience now with two redo pyeloplasties. Uh, from other uh, uh, institutions. And when they're done retroperitoneal, uh, the robot's quite nice because you're going intraperitoneal. So those have been actually a lot easier than I thought. Well, let's move on uh, to our next subject. Um, I think all of us this year have developed new hobbies. Mine has been uh, growing cactuses in the backyard and every once in a while you get you know, super rewarded and it's coming around to a year, so I'm hoping to get some of these flowers coming out in the next few months, the next few weeks. Well, what about ectopic ureters and ureteroceles? If there's no function, uh, the approach is ablative surgery. If there is function, uh, then it's kind of a distal uh, UU, or you can do the UU even higher. As a reminder, this is uh, what our x-rays will look like, big fat ureter, non-functional system. And the key maneuvers here are basically dissecting out that upper pole ureter uh, underneath the healthy lower pole vessels. What's nice about this is that you're going to take the upper pole ureter out when it's non-functional so you can get super aggressive, you can pick it up, you can be right on the ureter. And the key is really to find that window. Um, this is uh, right side and you can see that we've got the robotic instrument underneath these very healthy, robust lower pole vessels. And we're now kind of making the window where we're gonna pop in through here, uh, just as we would do open, and then be able to pass this upper pole ureter uh, up underneath the vessels, and then use that as a handle to do our upper pole uh, nephrectomy. If this patient had had good upper pole function, then we would basically re-implant, and that can be really done anywhere along uh, the line here. Uh, robotically. So with our right hand, you can see we're kind of making our window. You can see these robust vessels are being kind of left alone here. And the key, one of the other keys is to do as much dissection and pull the ureter as much as you can before you make the window. Once that window is made, you can then transect the upper pole ureter. We'll do the distal urectomy. Uh, after we do the upper pole partial nephrectomy, and you can see that upper pole ureter passes very nicely uh, underneath the vessels. And again, once that's up, you use it as a handle. And then uh, with a ligature, uh, we can go ahead and then uh, complete our upper pole partial nephrectomy. Since we're not dealing with really a lot of functional kidney tissue, uh, the ligature works very nicely here. And there's really should be minimal blood supply since it's essentially a non-functional system. And here is an example of that. Descended testes, uh, we don't use a robot for this, but we do uh, do laparoscopy. Um, we do a lot of uh, laparoscopy also for our patients with disorders of sex development. Here are some intra-abdominal testes. Uh, here is a street gonad, uh, also street gonads here. Here is a uh, patient with ovotesticular syndrome and laparoscopy and biopsy is uh, clearly uh, fantastic way to uh, deal with this. When uh, laparoscopic orchidopexy was first developed, we all kind of, um, I think, kind of laughed in the background and didn't really appreciate in the audience when you had a peeping testes that you pushed back in the abdomen. We all thought, geez, we can just do that open. But I must admit, over the years, um, you can, I think, do a much better and much more precise uh, retroperitoneal uh, dissection through the abdomen to mobilize these vessels and give these peeping testes and clearly, obviously, the intra-abdominal testes a uh, better chance at long-term survival. So we've really embraced our laparoscopic approach, especially for the intra-abdominal or the peeping testes. Uh, one trick that we like to do is, you know, how do you get that testes down? I call it the San Francisco earthquake approach because it does kind of look like an earthquake with all the shaking. 
we put a big, uh, big for us 11 millimeter trocar in through the scrotum uh, into the abdomen. And then our testes has been mobilized nicely. And then basically a grasper just on the gubernaculum, never really touching the testes, uh, <clears throat> grab that gubernaculum. Then the testes, the uh, pediatric testes will fit nicely into the trocar and then you can slide the trocar out uh, grab the gubernaculum from the outside, finish your mobilization, take off your peritoneum. Um, we occasionally put a little uh, button like in the old days. I use actually uh, a peanut gauze to help secure the testes. And we've been uh, quite pleased with our single stage uh, laparoscopic orchid apexes for the intra-abdominal testes. Once in a while, you're peeking in and you find that the testes actually is not in the abdomen, might be a patient with an increased BMI. You make your inguinal incision, you find the testes, and it's kind of neat to look at the old kind of classic standard peanut maneuver we do for open orchid apexy laparoscopically to see where that peanut's going. You can see how nicely uh, it's up in the retroperitoneum and um, how you can kind of really help mobilize the vessels here. We occasionally see what I would call symptomatic uracal cysts. Uh, we also see some uh, intra-abdominal uh, pathology, uh, retained kind of vitellin duct, and these will typically present uh, with infection near the embolicus. One point I'd like to make is I'll often have a patient who has an incidental uh, uracal anomaly that's diagnosed when we're looking at the kidneys uh, for follow-up and hydronephrosis, and I would uh, submit that those patients don't need any uh, further care or treatment for that incidental anomaly. The patient comes in with infection uh, around the umbilicus, an infected uracal cyst, that's cooled off, and then those would be removed uh, laparoscopic or robotically later on. Here's an example of a patient that we were planning to remove a uracal cyst, but basically found uh, a vitellin connection of retained bowel to the embolicus, and this was about a you know 10 minute procedure basically to remove this from the embolicus and cut off the extra bowel and it was a chance to have our general surgeons come over and look on the council and <laughs> give them some idea what they can do with a robot but uh, this macerated as an infected uracal cyst. Finally I'd just like to present a relatively recent case um, this relates to a patient with a disorder of sex development, and this was a patient with uh, a severe uh, virilization who had congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This is how the patient presented. I saw this uh, baby at one year of age for bilateral non-palpable testes. You can see that there's some mild penile torsion, you know, the most mild of glandular hypospadias. So I last kind of, uh, discussion with the family is let's just check the genes to make sure there's no surprises here. And there was a big surprise in that this patient was actually XX with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. The patient had initial surgery and um, the vagina, which uh, uh, Mike will remember because he helped me with this, was so high up that we could not get the vagina out to the skin and basically did, did feminizing surgery. The patient did super well. And now that I'm getting older and the patient's getting older, uh, presented uh, again as planned as a teenager and started to menstruate through a common urogenital channel. What we can see on MRI is a big vagina uh, with blood in it. Here is the collapsed bladder here. Here's our di dissection plane. And our goal is we have to get the vagina, which is seven centimeters from the skin, now down to the skin. Here's kind of a 3D reconstruction, a little bead on the perineum, and here's our confluence right below the bladder. Well, this is tailor-made for robotic surgery. Um, our adult colleagues uh, operate in the pelvis all the time. Uh, that's uh, what they're using uh, the robot for, for the prosthetic work. Here's endoscopy showing the normal cervix, and uh, there's a lot of uh, mucus and stuff because of the patient's postpubertal, and you can see we're really close to the bladder and neck here. Uh, I placed double J stents preoperatively because I was worried about the ureters. Here's our robotic approach, uh, big uterus, I, I'm sorry, normal size uterus, but postpubertal. Basically here's the vagina down here and the confluence 
And our goal here is to kind of separate that vagina and then bring it out through the perineum. Normal ovaries on either side, our ureters are gonna be out here with the stents um, and our plane of dissection is gonna be above the uterus uh, and going basically between the bladder uh, and the uterus uh, and vagina to separate out that, that, out that vagina and find the confluence. Here's our initial dissection plane, vagina, uterus here, vagina here. And by placing a, a series of hitch, hitch stitches, we can basically uh, pull the bladder up uh, nicely, pull the vagina down nicely, and then find where that really narrows down to the confluence um, as it's going uh, into the uh, urethra here. So here's our vagina. You can kind of see we're dissecting on either side. Uh, in this case, we did put an assist port in basically as a sucker. The urethra is gonna be here. Here's a confluence where it connects and trying to do this operation through the perineum, I think would just be kind of insane. We're now cutting basically the distal vagina. If you look, you can see our catheter. And if you look in here, that's basically our urethra. So this is being taken off right at the confluence. This distal aspect of the vagina is gonna be discarded and this is gonna be over sewn. This is a very small space and the robot really lent itself for visualization as well as the technical aspects. Once it's over sewn, we now have the vagina which has been dissected free both laterally, anteriorly and posteriorly, but blood supply left in place. You can grab the vagina with a tonsil, pull that out to the skin, get rid of all of our intra-abdominal stuff and it reached very nicely uh, and now we've got uh, the normal two holes as opposed to one hole, which we started with. Uh, she's far enough out, her double J's are out and everything's in good shape, shape here. So another, I think, really nice use uh, of uh, robotic surgery for complex urologic problems. <laughs> Shout out to uh, Mike and Hillary, uh, nurses, our OR, the rest of our team and staff for uh, really helping to take care of our patients. Um, thanks everyone and uh, look forward to uh, taking any questions for our pediatric urology team. Great, thanks Larry and Hillary and Mike. I didn't see any questions. And again, if there are other questions, uh, they can be raised at the breakout, which is gonna follow the talks. There's, uh, there's okay. one quick question from Jim. Hey, Jim, uh, nice to hear from you. And his question is, can you address when orchiectomy is indicated in a patient with unascended testes, either based on appearance of the testes um, or age of the patient? And I would answer that if you can't get it down and uh, the testes uh, uh, is just so high up um, and it's gonna end up being in the abdomen and the other testes is normal, I think it's reasonable taken out. So we're talking about basically in the teenage years in general, we basically try to get all of them, obviously, as uh, we all would do down where you can kind of do surveillance. If the testes is abnormal, uh, you know, or a nub, and I, I certainly agree we want to we want to get that out. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Larry. Great. And our next speaker who I introduced at the beginning is David Bain, who's joining Marshall and uh, Tom. He's going to speak about new techniques for percutaneous stone surgery. All right, my screen should be coming up because can everyone see it? Yes. Okay, and can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. All right, great. So I wanted to start by saying thank you for the opportunity to speak to everyone today on a topic that I really enjoy. Today we'll be talking about new techniques in percutaneous nephrolithotomy. I have no disclosures to report. I see I'm gonna to try to uh, zoom out on my screen here. You guys are getting a lot of my toolbar here. Hold on, maybe that will be better. Okay, so 
First of all, to orient everyone, I'm going to be stressing the importance of urologist performed renal access, followed by a discussion of fluoroscopic and ultrasound guidance for PCNL. I'm then going to discuss the benefits of having an expanded toolbox of skills in your approach to PCNL, followed by some useful tips and tricks. I'll then wrap up with a brief preview of some exciting research we're doing on predictors of stone recurrence and some interesting novel approaches around dietary modification to prevent stone recurrence. So first and foremost, I need to give credit to Dr. Stoller. He's one of my key career mentors, and he's a trailblazer for endourologists in advocating for urologists to obtain their own renal access. This paper's from 1994, and as you can see, uh, he's been advocating for this for decades. And access obtained by urologists is not only safe, it's actually been shown to be more cost effective than outsourced renal access obtained by interventional radiologists for PCNL procedure. One of the advantages obtained from urologist access is their understanding of renal anatomy when it comes to the ideal puncture site for kidney stone clearance. And so this paper highlights the importance of a posterior rather than an anterior calyx access point in lower pole renal, pun renal punctures when the patient's in the prone position using fluoroscopic guidance. So the orientation of the lower pole tends to almost always be in an anterior posterior orientation. The upper pole uh, access, sorry, it looks like Tom made a comment there. Um, and so the upper pole punctures, uh, the precise angle of the needle is less important because the orientation is in the um, medial lateral orientation. I've also been very lucky to have Dr. Chi as a career mentor who's been a trailblazer in ultrasound guided renal access. And with our increased usage of ultrasound guidance, we've been able to increase our versatility with our PCNL procedures. We've both increased our utilization of mini PCNL as well as supine positioning during PCNL. With ultrasound guidance, renal access can be used to achieve both upper and lower pole entry into the collecting system. And posterior access is much easier to visualize than ultrasound imaging. Sorry, it's much, much easier to visualize with ultrasound imaging. And this is an image from an ultrasound screen during a PCNL procedure. And you can see left of screen, the needle is entering the collecting system at the upper pole. And this is highlighted by the white arrow. But ultimately, it's important to be competent in both ultrasound and fluoroscopy for PCNL. Ultrasound has the advantage of advanced precision with the needle placement for posterior calyces, and fluoroscopy provides advantages in visualizing the dilation process after access is obtained. And as the point person for simulation training for residents in the department at UCSF Urology, I've developed a curriculum to teach skills in both ultrasound and fluoroscopy guided PCNL. It's a staged curriculum stratified by expectations along the postgraduate years where residents can use both the renal phantoms on screen left and the Europerk mentor uh, to practice their skills. The Europerk mentor is excellent for learning fluoroscopy guided PCNL. And these are actually side by side images. One on the screen left is the trainee's hands. The image on screen right is actually the ultrasound screen. And you can see the renal phantom provides a nice comparison to actual targeted needle puncture that we see when we're actually doing the procedure. So working with Dr. Chi and Dr. Stoller, we've been able to demonstrate that with increased experience, ultrasound access can, can also be achieved in obese patients. And this is actually a figure from that paper you saw. So the data from our operative registry at UCSF shows that after about 100 cases of experience, it's possible to achieve near equivalent rates of successful ultrasound access in patients of all BMIs, and that even includes 
the morbidly obese patients with a BMI of greater than 40. And in these situations with very long skin to stone distance, you can employ long amplast balloon dilators and sheaths that prove particularly handy in those situations. Also with increasing practice, we've been able to show that renal tract dilation can be achieved successfully and safely with ultrasound guidance. So the key is in order to dilate with ultrasound guidance, you have to have excellent renal imaging using the ultrasound probe. And it's really important to be able to visualize the wire from the skin all the way to the collecting system to ensure the dilator slides easily over the wire without kinking. And with good imaging, you can actually see here the entire length of the dilution, dilation balloon uh, under ultrasound. So this figure represents a heat map of the countries globally without access to timely and appropriate surgical care. And you can see this is something that we don't often talk about, but the vast majority of the world doesn't have surgical treatments that we take for granted here and we discuss in conferences like this. And so my academic interests in part involve how we can bring standard of care urologic treatments to countries that otherwise do exclusively open stone surgery for kidney stones due to lack of resources. So I recently received an implementation grant from the UCSS Center for Health Equity in Surgery and Anesthesia uh, to show use of handheld ultrasound probes as a low-cost intervention to diagnose urinary retention as well as hydronephrosis in urology clinics in low-income countries. The pilot of this study is actually in Guyana, South America. This device costs about $2,000, which is almost up to $5,000 less than your standard clinic bladder scanner, and even a whole order of magnitude less than a standard ultrasound machine. And the hope is that this will open the door to eventual training and impl implementation of teaching ultrasound guided PCNL in these low resource countries. And I have found personally that ultrasound access has been really useful in doing these procedures with supine positioning. And we often now place the patient in a modified lithotomy position to allow for simultaneous anterograde and retrograde access to the kidney. And this is a patient of mine. It's an example of an obese patient with a complex stone burden and very long skin to stone distance. And in this patient, we were able to use supine positioning and ultrasound access to get both simultaneous nephroscopy and ure ureteroscopy access to the collecting system and we were able to achieve stone clearance with just one puncture. So this can also facilitate visualization at the point of dilation. This is called, in, in our field of endourology, it's called endoscopic combined intrarenal surgery using the acronym ECIRS. And this photograph is actually a, a photo borrowed from Dr. Stoller showing the nephrostomy tube aftermath of multiple access tracts in the kidney. This was done in an era, I'm told, uh, prior to flexible ureteroscopy and certainly prior to uh, endoscopic combined intrarenal surgery. And these multiple tracts undoubtedly increase complication risk in PCNL procedure, as well as downstream risk for kidney function loss after the procedure. So I'm going to pull up a video here, bear with me. So this is a video demonstrating the setup for ECIRS. I'm gonna skip ahead to the most relevant point here. Okay, so you can see that there is access from above and below here. And because there's endoscopic visualization uh, directly through the ureteroscope place retrograde, they're able to watch themselves perform the dilation directly uh, through the ureteroscope screen. Uh, and in this case, it's an upper pole access and safe dilation is achieved by visualizing entry of the dilating sheath into the upper pole. Sorry for the choppiness of this video, but you can see that uh, Dr. Chi here is placing the uh, nephroscope in while our resident Mira is watching the scope go in. And I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit. <clears throat> 
Okay. Okay. And then here you can see the attending is controlling the ureteroscope and the resident is controlling the cystoscope. And this allows for optimal visualization of the collecting system for really efficient clearance of all of the calyces. All right, so some tips and tricks to PCNL. So when you're not doing an ECIRS procedure, one of the things you can do is you can place a five French uh, access sheath retrograde and hook up a one liter saline bag of irrigation to drain with gravity into the collecting system. The advantage of this is it prevents excessive pressure on the kidney with hand irrigation and also allows for jet gentle distension of the kidney prior to an ultrasound guided puncture facilitating uh, visualization of the calyces and uh, puncture into the kidney. Another, along these lines, you can also, you can also ask the anesthesiologist to inject IV methylene blue. Uh, if you've dilated and you're having some trouble getting into the collecting system, you may be just outside the collecting system with a small hole, and you can use the methylene blue to find your entry into the collecting system. And along these lines, it's always better to be too shallow and have to spread with the uh, nephroscope graspers over the wire to get into the collecting system than to be too deep and cause injury to a vessel or perforate. And as anyone knows who works with kidney stones, a crucial challenge in treating the, the disease is preventing recurrence after surgery. And one particular interest for me is figuring out how to improve patient follow-up and adherence in stone prevention, starting with diet and nutrition. And this survival, survival curve here, uh, it's not time to, it's not survival, it's time to stone recurrence. And using UCSF data, we've looked at how patient food environment impacts stone recurrence. And we found that regional availability of grocery stores or density to healthy food options doesn't seem to impact time to stone recurrence. This is interesting though, because income absolutely impacts time to stone recurrence. This is a depiction of census tract income Orange is high in, uh, blue is low income and orange is all other uh, census tracts. And among UCSF patients, residents in a low income census tract is associated with faster time to stone recurrence. This work is ongoing. I'm currently co-leading the development of two clinical trials to study dietary supplemental inter intervention and virtual dietary counseling intervention on stone recurrence. And from an epidemiologic perspective, I'm on a K-12 grant through the NIH looking specifically at the intersection of diet, socioeconomic status, and risk of kidney stone recurrence. So in conclusion, percutaneous renal access by the urologist is achievable and safe. There are benefits to both ultrasound and fluoroscopic guidance, and there are factors contributing to stone recurrence that are complex, likely related to social determinants that impact follow-up and adherence after surgery. I want to thank and acknowledge uh, Dr. Chi and Dr. Stoller, to whom I both uh, I owe both a great deal as career mentors and helping me put this talk together. I want to also thank Dr. Mang and Dr. Pruthi for organizing this event today. And I want to thank our fellows, Dr. Fidel Hamuchi and Dr. Justin Ahn, both for their contributions to this talk. And I wanted to actually highlight that Dr. Justin Ahn will be joining our endourology uh, group this coming year, and he'll be leading our expansion into the peninsula starting in the fall of 2021. We also have some upcoming courses in ultrasound guided renal imaging for procedures coming up at the AUA in Las Vegas this year. So please stay tuned for that. And please, please feel free to contact me via email with any questions, comments, or insights. Thank you. Great, David. That's that's great work. And I mean, I think what you're working on is sort of extending what Marshall's done for decades, Tom's done for many, many years. I mean, I think, you know, that, that one heat map showing what the potential of, you know, introducing a simple technology for a very common disease worldwide will be, you know, absolutely, you know, very impactful. So that's that's great work. Thank you. Our next speaker, um, and I don't think I saw any questions. So, and if there are, David will be in the breakout session.
Uh, next speaker is Dr. Michelle Van Kuyken, who I introduced earlier. She is joining Ancestkind, and now we have a more robust uh, team uh, managing uh, female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. Yeah, thank you. So today, um, I'm really just going to focus on one topic. Um, that's sort of a hot topic in female pelvic reconstruction right now. And that's the idea of uterine preservation for pelvic organ prolapse surgery. So we know that there's many treatment options for pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and we have to offer all of these patients these choices when we see them in the clinic. You know, I go down the line with all patients of discussing reconstructive versus obliterative procedures. Does the patient want to have the option of having a patent vagina for penetrative intercourse? If not, a copoclysis is a good option. We can also discuss the pros and cons of an abdominal versus a vaginal approach for their pelvic organ prolapse surgery, and there's pros and cons to each. I also offer patients the option of a mesh augment, um, you know, in the form of an abdominal sacrocolpopexy. We're no longer using any transvaginal mesh for pelvic organ prolapse versus a native tissue repair as there are a growing number of women who are increasingly mesh averse, even with sacrocopopexy mesh, just due to the concerns that they've seen with transvaginal mesh. And then what we'll talk about today is this idea of uterine preservation versus uterine removal. Um, and is uterine removal always absolutely necessary at the time of pelvic organ prolapse surgery? And what I hope to discuss today is that no, in fact, it is not. Regardless of the option that you choose, the vast majority of these surgeries are minimally invasive and women can go home the same or the next day. So historically, pelvic organ prolapse surgery has always involved hysterectomy. Um, and this has a lot of historical basis. And I think a lot of what has happened now is it's done out of habit. We know we have outcome data that supports the use of uterine removal at the time of pelvic organ prolapse surgery. And it's relatively easy to correct the apical defect when the uterus is no longer in place. However, as we redefine the terminology surrounding pelvic organ prolapse and what we think the potential etiologies and problems are, we found that really the uterus is not the problem. Um, it's a failure of the surrounding support structures that are supporting the uterus. And you know, given that, we've actually redefined the terms in the way that we define um, apical versus uterine prolapse. Um, and so instead of saying, you know, the uterus is prolapsing, it's the apical compartment that's prolapsing. So we're, we're assigning the deficit to the, the apex itself and the support structures as opposed to the uterus. So what are some of the advantages of uterine preservation? So first and foremost, patient preference. Um, there was a study done back in 2013 by Frick and Barber um, that surveyed women about their preference of having their uterus removed at the time of pelvic organ prolapse surgery. They found that up to 50% of women preferred uterine preservation if the outcome was superior or the same as hysterectomy. Even more interesting was that up to 20% of women said that they would prefer uterine preservation even if the outcome of their surgery was inferior to hysterectomy. So this is really important because it outlines, you know, the importance of giving women this choice. And there are some women that feel very strongly about maintaining their uterus at the time of surgery. Interestingly as well, uh, geographic region was an independent predictor of uterine preservation. And notably, and importantly for, for those of us in California, that this was actually highest in the West. So we have a higher percentage of patients um, who desire uterine preservation surgery. So what are some of the potential advantages of uterine sparing? So in the different comparative studies that have looked at this, they found that a uterine sparing operation um, has a shorter operative time on average. Um, there's less blood loss at the time of surgery. And they found that there's no difference in the length of stay. In the post-operative period, these patients tend to have a faster recovery time. And when the procedure is performed vaginally, they've actually found that there's a threefold decreased risk of de novo overactive bladder with uh, uterine sparing surgery versus trans, uh, total vaginal hysterectomy. And essentially, there's no difference in patient satisfaction or outcomes or anatomic recurrence when the uterus is preserved. So another really important aspect of um, uterine preservation is fertility preservation. This is sort of a new um, area of interest, but we know we, we have this population of women who are still in their childbearing years, who we've often and historically told to use pessary and wait until their family planning is complete. However, there's a lot of 
issues with young women wearing pessaries, you know, like any woman who we fit for a pessary, sometimes pessaries are just not well tolerated, whether it causes discomfort or bothersome vaginal discharge, it may just not be a good option for everyone. It's also hard in these younger women who are sexually active and potentially still fertile, um, you know, for sexual activity. Most uh, women will remove the pessary um, at the time of sexual activity, but it still provides some degree of discomfort. And these women may also suffer from issues with body and self-image. You know, they're young and having significant prolapse that may make themselves feel uncomfortable. There's now been um, a fair amount of data that's starting to amass, obviously mostly retrospective, that demonstrates that native tissue approaches are safe with no reported pregnancy complications thought to be attributed to the prolapse repair. So these native tissue approaches, which I'll talk about in a little bit, are either your sacrospinous ligament fixation or uterosacral ligament suspension, um, a mesh or a graft. Um, synthetic graft should not be used in these women who desire um, future pregnancy, as there could be some increased risk of complications with uterine expansion um, during the pregnancy. And generally, if you've performed um, a uterine pres uh, preserving procedure, a C-section would be recommended. I also counsel these patients that there's a high likelihood that the, the prolapse will occur, you know, the surgery will essentially um, come undone at the time of the pregnancy, and they may require a repeat procedure when their pregnancy um, is completed. However, some women are willing to, to tolerate that risk and they understand that when you explain the risk and benefits. So what are the outcomes of uterine sparing surgery? So actually, they're quite good. Um, so this is a recent study that was published um, in the uh, British Medical Journal in 2019 that compared sacrospinous hysteropexy versus vaginal hysterectomy with uterosacral ligament suspension. And they followed these women for five years. Um, there was uh, groups of women with stage two or greater prolapse who were randomized to either um, TVH with uterosacral ligament suspension versus sacrospinous hysteropexy. And they followed these women for five years looking at anatomic, symptomatic, and retreatment rates. And what they saw um, was that at five years, sacrospinous hysteropexy was actually superior to um, vaginal hysterectomy with uterosacral ligament suspension with respect to retreatment rates at only 1% versus 7.8% in the vaginal hysterectomy group and was non inferior in all other domains, meaning that these patients had. Um, statistically insignificant differences in their overall anatomic failure and composite outcomes of success. So in terms of how to perform uterine sparing surgeries, um, there's the vaginal native tissue approaches um, that can be, for, be performed very similarly to whether the uterus is left in situ or not. Um, you can uh, perform an intraperitoneal operation um, by performing a uterosacral ligament suspension. Um, the way you would do this is by creating a posterior colpotomy, um, similar to how you would get in for a, a vaginal hysterectomy um, and place your sutures in the uterosacral ligaments bilaterally. And then typically the sutures will be placed sort of in the barrel of the cervix posteriorly, posteriorly and tied up to suspend the uterus. You can get really great um, vaginal length with this procedure. The other option, if you want to stay extra peritoneal, um, and is actually more um, described in the literature, is the sacrospinous ligament fixation. Again, the advantage of this operation if you're leaving the uterus is that it can be performed ex entirely extra peritoneally. So it can be ideal for a woman who you have um, qualms about entering the peritoneal cavity. Um, again, there's also great literature, um, such as the previous study that supports, um, you know, sacrospinous ligament fixation for this indication. Again, you'd perform this operation in the same way. You can either enter anteriorly or posteriorly um, to gain access to your sacrospinous ligament, um, place sutures in the ligament, and then again, um, typically we'll place the sutures in the barrel of the cervix and tie everything up to suspend the uterus. There's also a more historic procedure called the Manchester procedure. Um, that's a form of uterine sparing. It's something that I have personally never performed, um, but it involves cervical amputation and plication of the cardinal, uh, cardinal ligaments. And again, this would not be a procedure that could be used um, in a patient desiring future fertility, while these top two um, have been shown to be safe. The other options, if you want to perform an abdominal approach, um, you can do your uterosacral ligament plication um, from above. 
Alternatively, you can perform it like a sacrocolpopexy by using the anterior longitudinal ligament on the sacrum. Um, and this is called a sacrohistoropexy. Um, and there's a couple of ways that this can be done. This particular image over here shows that the mesh is being laid anteriorly, and then the two arms are being brought up to the cervix, or sorry, to the sacrum. I've also performed this where um, the mesh will wrap around the opposite direction and will lay the two pieces um, anteriorly. Um, and again, mesh augment is not recommended for uh, fertility preservation. So when comparing sacrohistoropexy um, to a uh, supracervical hysterectomy, which is the traditional way to perform sacrocolpopexy, um, the authors below in their meta-analysis found that patients who had a sacrohistoropexy um, had decreased mesh exposure, shorter operative time and cost, and there were no um, observed differences in outcomes. So deciding who's an, a candidate for uterine preservation is also important. So you want to select women who you think have a low risk of uterine pathology. So these would be any premenstrual woman who has normal menses, a postmenopausal woman who has had a his, history of a negative evaluation, so either a prior um, EMB, endometrial biopsy, or transvaginal ultrasound. Um, because we know that postmenopausal women, based on this study um, done by um, Frick and pro uh, published in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, um, showed that women without a history of prior um, bio without a history of postmenopausal bleeding, um, without a prior biopsy, have about a 2.6 percent risk of unanticipated pathology um, later on. However, um, and importantly, uterine preservation is not recommended in women with a history any history of postmenopausal bleeding, even if they've had a negative endometrial biopsy. And this is because at the time of uterine removal, they found that up to 13% of these women were found to still have pre or actual malignant findings. And so um, women with a history of postmenopausal bleeding, even if they've had a negative evaluation, should not be offered uterine sparing surgery and should be offered a hysterectomy. Um, here's another list of some other um, relative contraindications to uterine preservation. Again, so any sort of abnormal bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding. If the patient has a strong family history of any type of cancers um, of the female gen genitourinary tract, including ovarian um, or uterine cancer, um, pre previous um, tamoxifen therapy, or other sort of uterine pathology that may make your sur uh, surgery difficult. Um, so in summary, some uterine for uterine preservation for pelvic organ prolapse repair, there's a number of advantages. Um, so really the greatest advantage is it provides patient with choice. And it also allows for a future fertility option. As I mentioned earlier, there's about 20% of women who, when they seek um, care for their pelvic organ prolapse, would desire uterine preservation, even if they thought the outcome of their surgery would be inferior. Studies have shown that regardless of the procedure is undertaken vaginally, or abdominally, there's lower morbidity with shorter operative and recovery times. And with um, um, and we may experience less de novo OAB symptoms um, versus hysterectomy. And one other advantage is that we can avoid peritoneal entry with sacrospinous hysteropexy. Um, I have a patient similar to this recently um, who I saw, you know, a young patient who's 51 years old who had prior extensive intra-abdominal surgery and history of multiple bowel obstructions. Um, so after careful counseling, we decided that avoiding the peritoneal cavity entirely would be advantageous for her. Um, so we opted to provide uh, perform a sacrospinous hysteropexy for her. So that's someone who I would deem a great candidate for this operation. Some potential cons um, of uterine preservation are that, you know, our long-term data is less robust. However, um, there are a number of studies and meta-analyses showing that um, these operations are indeed non-inferior and do provide some of the benefits mentioned above. And the other con is that there are risks of, man of managing gynecologic pathology moving forward. Um, so making sure that you really engage in proper patient selection and take an adequate history to make sure that you're not missing out on any um, known risk factors for uterine or cervical pathology um, moving forward. And of course, if you have any concerns about this, consultation with a gynecologist um, would be imperative. So in conclusion, you know, uterine sparing surgery really should be offered when considering prolapse repair in the appropriate patient.
Uh, we know that uterine sparing procedures can be considered in patients who desire future fertility. And if this is done, it should be done using a native tissue repair, either in the form of a uterosacral ligament suspension or sacrospinal ligament fixation. And they, you should avoid the use of a mesh or a graft. Um, and initial outcome data show that this really truly is a non-inferior -in um, operation compared to when it's performed to its uterine removing counterpart surgeries. So with that, take any questions? That's great, Michelle. And this is clearly an area I'm very naive about. So I'll ask two uh, <laughs> maybe stupid questions. I would say, number one, how much of practice patterns in the past or going forward are determined by whether it's a urologist or gynecologist performing it and preferences for uterine preservation? And kind of related to that would be, well, now, now that I think people are much more comfortable doing, you know, XI robotic procedures, is there a shift to go more trans-abdominal and how has that impacted what is being done or what should be done? Yeah. So, you know, historically, you know, I think the fact that the uterus always was removed, you know, it's sort of the gynecologic footprint in all of this about, um, I think pelvic organ prolapse is the third most common indication for hysterectomy in this country. So it's a pretty commonly done operation. Um, but I think what's nice about this is that, um, you know, I think both, uter uh, both urologists and gynecologists are starting to utilize these techniques um, and fellowship. You know, I had worked um, with a, a gynecologist who was performing uh, the uterosacral ligament suspensions. Um, but I think this really opens the door to nicely allow both urologists and gynecologists to perform these procedures. I don't know if there's any data showing that it's being done by one more so than the other, um, but it's definitely growing in popularity and, you know, everyone's being encouraged to really counsel patients, you know, on these options. Um, and in terms of, you know, the direction, you know, um, you're right, so sacral colpopexy has really sort of taken off in the intra-abdominal repairs in terms of what's most commonly done um, because there's data that shows the repair can be a little bit more robust. However, um, you know, there's an increased risk of mesh complications moving forward. And so I think, you know, adequately counseling women that, you know, while their prolapse repair outcome may be superior um, with a sacral colpopexy, they may be at a higher risk of needing some type of revision, you know, for a mesh erosion or complication which some studies have shown can be up to 10% at seven years with a sacral colpopexy. So it's not insignificant. So I think, um, especially now with this sort of increased concern about mesh, there's some of these vaginal procedures are actually coming back into vogue a little bit more for those reasons. Great, perfect. Well, thanks a lot, Michelle. That was an excellent talk. Um, and the next speaker is Dr. Lindsay Hampson, who is gonna uh, update us on what's new in male reconstruction. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about what's new in genital urinary reconstruction. Honestly, there are a lot of things that I could talk about. And so picking just a few to highlight um, was difficult, but I'll try as I go to give you a kind of sense of all of what we're doing um, here at UCSF. Um, I have no disclosures to report. And what I'm gonna try to do is focus on three kind of topics. First, I'll talk about robotics and genital urinary reconstruction and um, kind of dive into bladder neck contracture repair as an example. I'll mention some new techniques in urethral stricture surgery, and then um, briefly talk about some multidisciplinary reconstructive care that we're offering. So first of all, in terms of robotic reconstruction, uh, you know, the use of robotics for reconstruction has really blossomed over the past few years. And um, I think with um, great outcomes in terms of our reconstructive procedures. So we've really started using robotics for many reconstructive procedures from pyeloplasty to uh, ureteral strictures, bladder neck contractures, and even some urethral strictures. And, and I say and more because honestly, we're kind of um, continuing to advance our knowledge and techniques of robotics and reconstruction um, and looking for more ways to use the robot to help us um, improve patient outcomes and potentially decrease morbidity. Um, so the one I'd like to kind of focus on today is a technique for bladder neck contracture repair. 
And as many of you know, um, bladder neck stenosis or vesicourethral and astomotic strictures mm -hmm. typically occur following prostate surgery. Um, of course, less so now that we have robotic techniques for prostatectomy compared to open prostatectomy rates. Um, and, but we do also see, see bladder neck stenosis after um, endoscopic prostate procedures as well. Um, some literature has been published on risk factors during BPH surgery for development of bladder neck stenosis. Surgical factors uh, seem to be having a small prostate or using a very large scope, having prolonged resection time, uh, which equates to kind of high energy usage, um, resecting the bladder neck, and also perforation of the bladder mucosa. So those patients are more likely to develop contracture afterwards. There are also some patient factors that have been identified, um, diabetes or cardiovascular risk factors, and also those patients with active prostatitis tend to have a higher risk of developing stenosis afterwards. So in terms of treatment options, typically the initial treatment for bladder neck contractures is endoscopic management. Um, and this can be done in a variety of ways. A cold knife incision, which is kind of pictured on the left, a hot knife incision using a Collins knife, laser incision, resection of the scar, dilation. And I'll say that, you know, over many studies, it doesn't appear that there's significant differences in the outcomes based on, um, you know, the type of technique that's used. I personally prefer using a cold knife um, to incise, but, um, you know, really when you look at the literature, it does not look like there are significant differences. And, you know, I would say the long-term success rates after these procedures ranges, it's typically, I would say, around 50%. With a second attempt at endoscopic management, there are some studies that get you up to a 70 to 80 percent success rate. Um, and if you look at the picture on the left, you know, this is an example of a, a very contracted scar, which, you know, springs open really nicely when incised. And you can see on the bottom, uh, you know, a nice open um, bladder neck after incision. There are also some studies that look at injecting steroids or mitomycin to help prevent recurrence. And uh, while some studies show that this is effective in terms of increasing success rates, I would say overall, this does not move the mark significantly. So while we may use these techniques, they're probably you know, not getting us to 100% success rates. So the real difficult problem is the recalcitrant bladder neck contracture that's already been incised um, or had an endoscopic procedure. And, you know, historically the um, approach to manage these was an abdominoperineal approach. And, and we had good success rates with 80 to 90% patency afterwards, but very high incontinence rates, greater than 90% in, in really most studies. And also fairly technically challenging. Um, many of these patients ended up requiring a pubectomy, which in a young patient with a pelvic fracture injury, um, it's one thing to do a pubectomy, but in older patients, there's significant morbidity associated with pubectomy with 30 to 50% rates of pelvic instability and chronic pain. So this is not something to attempt lightly. In addition, these um, open repairs often required grafts or flaps for the urethral construction as well as flaps for overlying coverage. And so I, um, the picture um, on the left kind of shows this abdominoperineal approach, um, which is very, you know, can be very challenging. And you can see why a pubectomy could be helpful. Um, on the right are some pictures that show, I think on the top is um, an anterior bladder tube reconstruction and then bringing an omental flap down over it for tissue coverage. And you can see the pubectomy has been performed. And on the bottom is uh, using a penile skin graft actually to reconstruct the urethra, and then bringing a rectus flap as tissue coverage. So these are pretty, can be fairly morbid operations, and in addition, uh, with really high incontinence rates. And so this is where the robotic approach comes in. Um, one of the benefits just, you know, thought to be this does not require dissection from the perineal side through the external sphincter, and so maybe we can have higher rates of continence afterwards. Um, the robot obviously deep in the pelvis also offers improved visualization and access. And um, if we can maintain urethral continuity through this approach, this is relevant if somebody needs an artificial urinary sphincter afterwards for incontinence, because we do know that those people who have had a complete transection of their urethra probably have higher rates of urethral erosion with sphincters later. So um, in thinking in the long term about these patients, this could also be another benefit to the robotic approach. Thank you.
So in our practice here, and uh, Dr. Breyer and I and Dr. Meng um, all do robotic bladder neck uh, reconstructions. Um, we do preoperative imaging with rug or VCUGs and or cystoscopy. I tend to place a suprapubic tube ahead of time to allow for urethral rest. And I think this is really important to allow the stricture to fully declare itself. That way we really know where the healthy versus diseased tissue is. And if there's any concern about the bladder function, I I uh, use urodynamics to evaluate that. And I would say, especially in somebody with a history of radiation, this can be important to decide if a reconstruction is actually the right road to go down for these patients. In terms of the approach, it's a typical robotic prostatectomy setup. Um, there are two kind of techniques that are described. One is a circumferential dissection of the bladder neck where the stenosis is located and excising that scar circumferentially and then completing a new anastomosis. And um, we have not used this technique at UCSF primarily because of concerns about, uh, you know, doing this circumferential dissection, which may um, result in kind of decreased vascularity um, and also higher risk of injury to the rectum, as you can imagine, you know, doing that posterior dissection. And so instead, we've really focused on the YV plasty technique. Um, and uh, I have some images over on the right, which kind of explain how the YV plasty is done. There's a Y incision where the uh, kind of long arm of the Y is made over the scarred tissue. And it's important to extend that into healthy urethra. And then the V itself is made in the bladder. And so in that way, you can actually use that V flap of the bladder as a healthy flap that is then brought down to the apex of the Y incision. And this allows you to you know, use that healthy bladder tissue um, for the urethral reconstruction, and then you can sew that V-flap into place. And we really have very good visualization robotically. Um, we can even remove just a portion of the pubic bone inferiorly if we need to for better visualization. And, um, you know, this is a um, very kind of uh, straightforward surgery to do. Patients typically spend one night in the hospital afterwards and go home with a catheter for four to six weeks. Um, because this is a newer technique, I would say the data on outcomes are, you know, limited. Um, although this is, as this is being done more and more, I think we're going to see more robust outcome data. Um, I quoted a few studies that have kind of medium term follow-up. Um, the one at the top is the TURN study, which includes UCSF. And this was looking at the kind of initial 12 patients um, who had bladder neck contractures, either following prostatectomy or endoscopic prostatic procedures. And all of these patients were non-radiated. Um, this showed a 75 success rate at a mean of one year of follow-up. And importantly, um, just over 80% of those who were continent preoperatively remained continent afterwards. Um, in this series, there was one case of a fistula that required repair in the two other small series. They didn't have any complications. Um, but overall, I would say this is, this is really well tolerated. And I think, you know, the high continence rates really reflect the benefits of using a robot for this technique. Um, I counsel all of my patients about the potential for developing incontinence afterwards, but we've seen similar to, you know, this series, we've seen very good continence rates afterwards. And I am reassured in those who do have incontinence and may need surgery afterwards that, um, you know, we have not completely transected their urethra. We've really only made a dorsal incision and that maintains blood supply for them. So I think that they likely have decreased rates of erosion um, with, you know, stress incontinence surgery later. Um, next, I'll turn to thinking about urethral stricture surgery. And of course, we have a long history of urethral stricture surgery here at UCSF led by our pioneer, Dr. Mackinich. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't at least step back a little bit and talk about the AUA guidelines for stricture management. Um, you know, I would say in general, every urologist has, uh, you know, endoscopic management as a tool in their chest for dealing with strictures. 
And there's long been a question about, you know, who should we be offering endoscopic management versus urethroplasty for? And, you know, the guidelines really spell out that if the uh, stricture is short, less than two centimeters and located in the bulbar urethra, um, you can offer endoscopic management. This could be dilation or urethrotomy. Data really do not show a difference in outcomes between the two. Typically, we leave a catheter for three days. And the overall success rate for um, endoscopic management really varies depending on the length and location of the stricture. Overall, though, I would say it's probably close to, you know, 10% um, for kind of all commerce strictures. Um, obviously, those strictures that are a wispy, you know, focal scar in the bulbar urethra are going to be more likely to have success with endoscopic management than a one and a half centimeter stricture in the distal bulbar urethra. Um, of note, um, you know, offering urethroplasty first has been shown to be a more cost-effective option. Although if you think that your success rate of your endoscopic management is above 40%, then it becomes more cost-effective to offer this first before moving to urethroplasty. So urethroplasty should obviously be considered for any recurrent bulbar strictures because the success of repeated endoscopic management is virtually 0%. Um, any penile strictures um, are not good candidates for endoscopic management and long strictures as well. And as I mentioned, this is a more cost-effective um, option as uh, going to this first and with very good long-term success rates, 75 to 95% success, depending on the technique and length of the stricture. Um, um, the good news also is if you are, uh, you know, have patients who are in the min minority who have recurrence after urethroplasty, about half of those can be managed with just a single endoscopic incision afterwards. Um, one important thing that Dr. Breyer and I studied previously is just thinking about what patients prefer. And we did a conjoint uh, choice-based analysis of patients with urethral stricture disease and found that actually of all the treatment attributes, success is by far the most important treatment attributes to patients. So really, I think if you counsel patients appropriately about the long-term success and outcomes of these procedures, most want a reconstructive surgery because they just want to have a successful outcome. Outcome. Um, interestingly, also, when we did a subgroup analysis by age, we also found that older patients really prefer better success rates and fewer subsequent procedures, even if it means undergoing a reconstructive procedure. And I think this is important because so many times, you know, we think, oh, it's an older patient or they have comorbidities. And so let's just see them for kind of repeated dilations or endoscopic management. And I think when you actually ask patients, the opposite is true, that they would rather just go through a reconstructive procedure and be done with it. So I think this is important to keep in mind when counseling patients about stricture management. So I'm going to just mention some new techniques for bulbar urethral strictures. And many of you probably know kind of the mainstay of treatment for short bulbar strictures has been anastomotic urethroplasty, which is pictured on the left, you know, cutting out the scar tissue, um, you know, completely transecting the urethra, spatulating, and then sewing back together. And this relies on the fact that there is some dual blood supply um, of the urethra, both through the dorsal artery dorsally and then the bulbar artery um, to the the proximal uh, spongiosum. Um, there have been raised concerns about transection. Um, you know, does this cause some ejaculatory dysfunction, which has been reported in some studies, as well as potentially adverse change in glands sensitivity or engorgement? And I think these things have been identified as we're getting a little more um, dialed into what to ask patients about. It's not just about asking about erectile dysfunction, which the rates are quite low, one to 2% based on um, reviews, but it's really about asking about more specific um, potential consequences. And once patients are asked about these details, we do find that uh, they, they do occur. And there are also some specific populations that we may be even more concerned about transection, those that have had hypospadias and do not have good blood flow to their urethra, those who have concurrent strictures or prior prostatectomy where they've had transection of their bladder neck, and particularly those with concurrent incontinence or who may develop incontinence after their surgery because you have a potential need for sphincters and as I've already mentioned, an increased risk of erosion with transection. So just briefly, some new techniques that um, are, you know, uh, in vogue and we're certainly using here at UCSF to, to with great outcomes. 
Um, the first, I think, was the vessel sparing and astomatic erythroplasty that was described by Jordan. And the picture on the top left shows you this, um, you know, what the bulbar urethra mobilized. You can see those bulbar arteries coming in. And if you work to spare those, you can open um, the urethra and cut out the strictured portion without um, uh, injuring the bulbar artery blood supply and then sew things back together with the idea that you've really maintained your blood supply rather than just completely transecting and losing that blood supply. In addition, then, um, Andrich and Mundy described a non-transecting urethroplasty with a slightly different approach where, and you can see this on the um, middle and bottom pictures, where you mobilize the urethra and make a dorsal incision. And, um, you know, it's important to get good mobility of the urethra dorsally so that you can fully expose the stricture. Um, we make a dorsal longitudinal urethra. And, and the nice thing about this is if you find that your stricture is longer than you anticipated, you're already set up to do a dorsal buccal urethroplasty, which would be kind of the mainstay um, for longer strictures. Um, you can either um, just do a closure, Heinecke Michelitz closure, without excising the scar tissue if it's a short stricture focal and you can get good patency without excising it. Um, and that's shown kind of in that middle picture. Or if needed, you can excise the scar uh, ventrally and reanastomose the ventral mucosa and then close again dorsally in a Heineke Michelitz fashion. And this has really been um, a great new um, tool in our arsenal for urethral strictures. And I, I show the outcomes of one nice study that has a large um, population, over 350 patients that um, looked at uh, transecting versus non-transecting urethroplasty. All of these cases non-radiated so that uh, outcomes are comparable with a mean stricture length of one and a half centimeters. And recurrence was defined as inability to pass a 16 French scope. Overall, the success rate for anastomotic urethroplasty, whether it was done in a transecting or non-transecting fashion, was very good, 95% with fairly good follow-up, and no difference in patency between transecting or non-transecting approach. So certainly these have very good outcomes. Also no difference in complications between the two approaches. The one difference that they did find, however, in terms of transection versus non-transection was a difference in sexual function. And so they looked at a change in IIEF of five points or more and found that those who had transection had higher rates of change in sexual function versus those with a non-transecting approach. So this may lend some credence to the concerns about, you know, does transection disrupt the blood flow and then cause changes in sexual function as a result. So lastly, I'd like to just mention some unique multidisciplinary reconstructive care that we offer here at UCSF. And one thing that um, Hillary Kopp mentioned earlier is our transitional urology program. And she and I run this program together. It's a monthly clinic um, where we see patients with congenital urologic conditions who are now adults. And we really see a wide variety of patients, but the key is that you know those patients who have congenital anomalies that were likely followed by a patient pediatric urologist and then become adults and need someone to transition to, we know that these are patients with complex reconstructive histories um, who often need further reconstructive surgery. And we found um, that by creating a specialized clinic for them, we can really be um, a kind of a center of excellence in terms of seeing these patients and, and especially in doing it jointly by having both the adult and the pediatric perspective. Um, we do a case conference with our fellows and attendings ahead of time where we review new patients as well as any complex cases. And we schedule these patients for one hour new patient visits. Um, these are complex patients with a lot of issues and, and previous surgeries. And so we found that having a dedicated one hour time slot for them is very important. They see both of us, Dr. Kopp and myself for that first visit, and then they follow up with me afterwards. Um, and we find this model works very well. Uh, we're able to really focus not only on the problems that they're dealing with, but also in talking with them about quality of life and their goals, because this is no longer just getting them through childhood. This is about then talking to them about the things that matter, sexual function, uh, incontinence, and trying to address those as best we can. Um, as a result, we do have a lot of reconstructive cases that come out of this. As I mentioned, you know, these are many patients with prior complex reconstruction, and unfortunately, many of these 
previous reconstructions, they have a half-life and they only last for so long. And so I put some examples of cases we've done in the last few months related to this catheterizable channels, either redoing them or creating new ones, bladder augments, um, removal of augments, um, either for hematuria to syria syndrome or augment malignancy. Um, so we've really enjoyed actually doing a lot of these cases um, together because we find that we really bring um, different skill sets to the table and I think these patients are better served as a result. Um, one brief thing I thought I'd mention is a, the continent catheterizable ileocecoplasty or CCIC. This is a technique we've really liked and we found is very useful for many of these adult congenital patients. Um, we have seen many people who, you know, have a poorly compliant or low capacity bladder and also have a catheterizable channel that has stenosed or they're having difficulty catheterizing. And this can really be a very nice technique where it gives them both an augment to expand their bladder volume and the creation of a new channel, which is continent. And so the cecum itself can be used for the augment. Um, and then we can take advantage of the ileocecal valve for the continence mechanism by tapering the terminal ileum and then bringing that up to the abdominal wall for their catheterizable channel. And this technique was initially described for use in spinal cord injury patients. And so I put um, the outcomes from the Neurogenic Bladder Research Group in their 114 patients. And you can see just like cystectomy or these, you know, larger urologic reconstructive procedures that, you know, there are high rates of complications and readmissions. Um, and many of them end up needing related surgeries. And most often that's because of the channel itself. And so, as I mentioned, even, you know, in kids, when, when these are done, they really, there is a half-life to these channels. And so whenever we're counseling patients, we, we really take care to talk to them about what their goals are and what might be, you know, down the road for them as well. But we've done this now in several patients and have had very good outcomes and the patients have been very happy afterwards. Um, and this is just another picture of the technique itself, which kind of gives you an idea of, you know, the anastomosis then between in the uh, ascending colon and the terminal ileum, and then using the uh, cecum to um, patch onto the bladder and bringing the terminal ileum up as the catheterizable channel. Lastly, I want to mention um, another uh, multidisciplinary um, care, you know, set of care that we offer for in reconstruction. And that's um, that Christy Butler is going to be joining us. We're super excited to have her. She just is finishing her gender affirming uh, surgery fellowship at OHSU. And she's going to be really leading our gender affirming care program, both research and um, patients. Um, and she's going to be seeing anyone that's coming for genital affirming care or seeking revision of prior genital reconstructive surgery. And she has experience in both feminizing and masculinizing, masculinizing genital affirming surgery. So creation of vulvoplasties or vaginoplasties. Um, and often this can be done during through a robotic approach. And then also metoidoplasty and urethral lengthening as well as phalloplasty. And, and this includes also placement of erectile prosthetic devices or testicular implants as well. So we're very excited to have her starting in the fall and think that this is a real um, wonderful addition to our reconstructive armamentarium. So with that, I'm just going to leave this slide of, you know, some of the reconstruction services we offer here at UCSF. We love seeing these patients. This is why we're here. Um, we love the complexity that they bring and, and um, you know, happy to talk about or answer any questions related to this. Great talk, Lindsay. Um, there was one question from Nadia. Hi, Nadia. I haven't seen you and Juan in the Noe Park too recently. Um, but the question was, and uh, you know, I think you alluded a little bit, but are you offering robotic bladder neck reconstruction repair as the primary treatment, or do you try some endoscopic procedure before moving on to, you know, more yeah, that's pervasive a, procedure? Yeah, that's a great question. And hi, Nadia. I, I miss you guys. Um, uh, you know, most of the studies that have published on it, um, the the 90% plus of the patients that have been included in these studies have undergone prior endoscopic procedures. And 
personally, I think, you know, with a 50% about success rate and with relatively, you know, low morbidity, um, I still offer this as a, the endoscopic management as first line. And so I'll, I won't go directly to bladder neck reconstruction and unless I think that I, for some reason, that the success rate with endoscopic management is, is likely to be much less than 50%. So I'll still attempt um, endoscopic management. If they have recurrence after one incision, then we'll talk about, you know, robotic reconstruction. And I think it's been a very good option. And all of the patients that I've done it in have had prior endoscopic management even before they came to me and then have had success with, um, with robotic reconstruction and have had really, you know, all of them have been continent afterwards as well. Another question for me, Lindsay, is that um, you had, you know, Clearly, robotic prostatectomy has led to decreased rates of bladder neck contracture compared to open prostatectomy historically, which is obviously good. Um, but probably there are a fair number of people getting post-prostatectomy radiation currently. Have we seen that many post-robotic prostatectomy bladder neck contractures, or is the rate in the sort of the epidemiology changed? Uh, have you, and then I know Ben hopefully still got connection, uh, have, has that decreased over time, do you think, just because we're doing it robotically, so it's not only help for the primary, but also after salvage or adjuvant RT? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, salvage or adjuvant radiation following prostatectomy is, uh, you know, those are honestly the majority of patients I see, whether it's bladder neck contractures or strictures, and then obviously higher rates of incontinence. Um, so I think that um, despite the you know, use of robotic surgery, which certainly has decreased bladder neck contracture rates overall, those that then get radiation, I think that it really does put them at higher risk of developing these strictures, whether it's a stricture in the membranoprostatic, you know, membranous urethra, or whether it's an anastomotic um, you know, stricture after robotic prostatectomy. And then it just, it, Unfortunately, then you tend to see these patients who have two problems of both having a, you know, bladder neck contracture as well as having incontinence, for example, and, you know, it's complicated then and, and I really counsel those patients about, you know, you're going to be with me for a while as we're working through this because we have to address the stricture first and let that heal before we then address the incontinence. So these are patients who I know long term and, and we're in it for the long road together. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Excellent update for us. Okay, well, so again, this is one of my favorite talks. I, I've been interested in this topic now for the last probably eight years or so. And really one of the, the things that's made this so compelling is that there are a lot of, a lot of people who are diagnosed with, with cancer um, in the United States every year. And in, among children, it's at least 4,000 boys who are diagnosed with, with a malignancy. And over the decades, as you can see from this slide, the, the chance of surviving their malignancy has increased dramatically. And so now for many of these patients, particularly the, the patients of, of reproductive age, reproduction, sexual function are, are some of the, the top concerns that, that these patients have. And they're, they're basically for adults, fertility preservation is possible, but for kids and kind of the peripubertal kids, that's really not something that's um, possible currently. And we'll, we'll dive into that today. So uh, beginning with the case of a 29 year old with testicular cancer, this was a patient who was interested in fertility after his testicular cancer treatment. He'd had a right orchiectomy three years ago and at the time, he opted not to bank sperm, and he was at high risk based on his pathology for recurrence, and he ended up receiving BEP times three. His spouse was 27 years old. She'd never been pregnant before. She was basically otherwise, otherwise healthy. So when, when you see him, FSH was very elevated at 37. Um, typically, an FSH above about eight is abnormal. Um, his testosterone was normal. His luteinizing hormone was also elevated. And his semen analysis um, was kind of a good news and bad news story. Um, it showed that he had sperm, but they were all non-moving. So essentially these were non-viable sperm. So in terms of the, the range of effects that cancer treatment can have on a man's fertility, it's, it's wide ranging, anywhere from a zero sperm count and azospermia to virtual azospermia like, like this particular patient, low counts, also poor quality sperm or potentially just a functional property. The semen analysis may look relatively normal, but there may be functional properties that are abnormal about the sperm. 
and of the surgeries that, that we do. Um, it can be difficulty with ejaculation, whether from an RPLND or some of the colorectal surgery, and more, more so uh, radiation than chemotherapy, but hypogonadism can also uh, result. Some of the lower risk treatments are treatments like vincristine, methotrexate, mitoxantrone, vinblastine. One of the problems is that there really is, there's no zero risk uh, chemotherapy. And so sometimes people will start out with a lower risk, what's considered lower risk, but then shortly thereafter, they'll relapse and they'll have to go to a, a higher dose or high, more uh, impactful chemotherapy. And it makes it, you really, as you'll see in a little bit, you can't bank sperm after they've been exposed to chemotherapy. Now, I've been in, interested in many of the novel targeted therapies for a number of years now, and tyrosine kinase inhibitors are, are one such where they're really interesting because tyrosine kinase inhibitors haven't been studied very well, like many of the, the novel uh, targeted therapeutics have not been studied well. But the, many of the functional properties of sperm, including capacitation, this essentially membrane changes in a sperm that allow the sperm membrane to become more flexible and allow it to uh, move very quickly in this process called hyperactivation. That's a tyrosine kinase mediated effect, as well as the acrosome reaction where the, the sperm is binding with an egg. These are processes that require um, tyrosine kinase and phosphorylation. And so we've done some in vitro studies that have demonstrated that, that these uh, agents can have an impact. Um, higher risk agents are many of the treatments we'd use for testicular cancer, and they can have, as you can see in this slide, they can have pretty significant impacts. Many of them, many of these patients will recover if you give them enough time, but not everyone. And the highest risk are our alkylating agents, and there's a very high risk of permanent um, decline in sperm counts, and many patients, particularly bone marrow transplant patients, um, this the induction chemotherapy for these transplants, stem cell transplants that lead to germ cell failure. From a radiation standpoint, it's the location that, that plays the, the biggest role and as well as the gonadal dose. And so as you're counseling patients and, and asking them how much gray the testicles are going to uh, receive, essentially there's a dose response here. And as the, the gray increases, azospermia can be, can be permanent. From a, a latex cell function, Essentially, if, if the, the Leydig cells and the testis are receiving more than about um, 20 gray for prepubertal children, essentially the chance of permanent hypogonadism uh, goes up substantially. And uh, so for this particular patient who, when you counsel him, he essentially has three options right now. His option would be to do a microsurgical testicular sperm extraction or a microtessie, along with in vitro fertilization at, the, at that time. He could do donor sperm and an intrauterine insemination or adoption. The microtessie itself is, is a technique that I do either the day of the egg retrieval or the day before the egg retrieval. Um, do it with local, cord block, and sedation can be done with general. Often that's, that's an expensive way to go, but there are a lot of logistical details that make this this case tricky to do. The case itself takes around two hours. Um, the, the lab often spends many, many hours. Um, so in a case like this, where it can be difficult to find sperm, there can often be two, three, four embryologists who are looking for sperm, and they can all each spend two or three or four hours to find five sperm, 10 sperm, some low number. In terms of the technique, essentially once I've delivered the testis, um, usually make a midline scrotal approach once I've delivered the testis and I'm using an operating microscope to find these find dilated tubules in a sea of, of very small, narrow tubules. And so this allows us to be more selective and, and essentially do less damage to the testis um, while, while uh, diving deep into the central aspect of the testicle and, and all throughout. If I were to just do a regular tessie, for example, it's just a random spot in, in one, or, one or two testicles, but this allows me to dive deeply and, and be more selective about finding sperm. As far as outcomes go, the, the uh, type of chemotherapy that they received, that, that a man received, really strongly is associated with their success. So many of our testicular cancer patients have higher sperm retrieval rates. And I would expect in, in this particular patient, if I see a patient who's ejaculating some sperm, the good news is, is that there's a very high likelihood that we're going to be able to find sperm with, with surgery. Um, for patients who don't have sperm in these cases, who've been exposed to alkylating agents, the, the retrieval rate is, is possible still, but, but a much lower success rate. Now, today, our standard fertility preservation 
uh, approach is to ask men to bank sperm. If they're unable for one reason or the other to, to produce a semen sample, then testicular sperm extraction can be done. And we do this uh, occasionally at the bedside, in the hospital, as the patient is, is waiting to um, get chemotherapy. Um, the process for doing intrauterine insemination is one that uh, one will take medications to induce ovulation. Um, uh, egg is released uh, just spontaneously into the fallopian tube. The patient in this case uses a thawed semen sample. At, uh, that semen sample is washed and then through a catheter through the woman's cervix that, that sperm is placed into the uterus. The technique, you need at least 5 million moving sperm. And so when a patient banks a semen sample, they usually lose on average about half of that semen sample. So you need to do one month of IUI, you need to start out with at least 10 million moving sperm. The cost is, is modest, um, uh, on average around $1,500. And, but the pregnancy rate is only about 15% per cycle. So for a couple, when you're strategizing with them about, bank, uh, about freezing sperm, you need to freeze often a lot of samples to allow them to do this, this particular approach. In vitro fertilization, on the other hand, is a much more powerful approach where a woman takes injection medications over the course of a couple of weeks. That stimulates her ovaries to make many, many eggs and on average, perhaps 20. And then that semen sample can be thawed and an individual sperm can be placed in each, each egg. You don't need very many sperm, um, but the cost is high. And it, it can cost for couples who are going down this IVF path out of their own pocket can easily go over $20,000. The, the, the chance of pregnancy though is much higher. And so of those, let's say 20 eggs, each one uh, having a sperm injected into it, you might end up with five to 10 embryos. So those embryos then are frozen and then one embryo can be transferred back to the, the uh, patient's partner. And each of those embryo transfers carries about a 50% pregnancy chance. So again, you need many fewer sperm. And one sample, for example, when patients are rushed could be frozen into many aliquots. So as far as guidelines go, most national guidelines from AUA, American Society of Reproductive Medicine, um, advise that uh, cancer patient, ca cancer doctors should discuss this risk of infertility um, with their cancer patients, or in the case of children with the parents or guardians, and discuss these types of fertility preservation options or to, or to send them to, to somebody like me to talk about it. Now, the, the whole process is pretty cumbersome and we're continuing to work on ways to try to make this better, but for inpatients, requires a urology consult and there are FDA required labs. And these include, as I've listed here in this slide, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HTLV one and two, RPR or treponemal tests and HIV. And again, these are required because the semen sample needs to be, to be used later on. The fertility centers won't accept this sample unless the, this virology is, is known, either negative or positive, they, they need to know about this. The consent is also cumbersome. Um, these days, what we do in the world of telemedicine is our nurse practitioner sends a DocuSign document to the patient, and then they see each other virtually, and the, our nurse practitioner actually has to see the patient initial and, and put their initials on every single one of about 12 pages, and then sign in multiple places. Then we schedule an appointment for banking samples, patient produces a sample in the hospital, it's a courier of the family taking it over to the, the uh, fertility center. It's frozen there at the UCS facility over by the Warrior Stadium. And then uh, shortly thereafter, they'll talk to me about strategizing. Was that enough samples or, or do we need to freeze more? As an outpatient, it's the same basic process, but often there's a little bit more time to, to figure things out. Um, sending a patient over to us. My nurse practitioner will again see the patient often virtually, get the labs, the consent, produce the samples, and often follow up with the patient by telemedicine, discuss these results and strategize. It takes a lot of effort really. And, and the faster that someone can be referred, the more chances they have to bank more samples and to do whatever we need to do to, to help them. So there are lots of reasons though that I've listed on this slide about why patients don't bank before from just the, these logistics are onerous for a lot of people. It can be really expensive. As of January 1st, 2020, California has mandated that HMOs uh, cover fertility preservation, but there are, there's a wide range of how coverage um, is interpreted. Sometimes that means just producing one sample um, and the patient may only have 500 sperm in the sample. And so, 
um, that, that that's a challenge we continue to work through. Um, the infrastructure for preservation may not be available for patients in, in Wairika or, or other places. So it's often it's difficult to, to bank. Sometimes believing that it's just not necessary. Um, in the case of lower risk chemotherapy, um, sometimes even in a case like this where the patient's getting orchiectomy, thinking that the second test is, is gonna be fine. And most of the time it is. Um, uh, from a pediatric standpoint, it's an experimental approach. And there are many reasons why it may not be the best thing to do. Um, and that being said, you know, patients often have a lot of regret if they, they don't bank and preserve their, their options. So again, refer as often as po early as possible. And one of the things that comes up is that if a patient's been exposed to chemotherapy, it can do significant damage to the DNA of that sperm and raise the high risk of miscarriage or birth defects in the children. So generally our policy is if it's been less than three months of, since exposure to any of these chemotherapies, they're not allowed to bank. Now the exception to that though, is that if there is any sperm there and they're about to receive alkylating agents or bone marrow transplants, they're with a consultation from me and really talking through the, the risks in detail, we will make exceptions to this um, with a lot of caveats and documenting this in, in their chart. So shifting to a young patient, this was a three-year-old boy who was brought to the emergency room, um, ended up having a brain tumor, underwent surgery to uh, remove this, this tumor. And this cord plexus carcinoma, um, essentially this child was uh, enrolled in a research trial and was advised that patient begin on vincristine, methotrexate, toposide, cytoxan, and cisplatin. Patient was stable and plans was made to initiate chemotherapy in, in a week. So he was going to also, as part of this, going to get a lumbar puncture and a central line catheter. His, patient, his, do, his dad, who was a, a doc here and his mom was psychologist, asked about these infertility risks and also asked about how can we preserve their fertility? So what can we tell them? Well, um, those treatments are associated with a very high risk of permanent sterility. Um, the, the child is, is too young, he's not yet gone through puberty. And so there are sperm stem cells that exist in the testis, but there's no way for this child to ejaculate, obviously. And, and so um, the, the present approaches of getting a, a semen sample just are not, not real, not feasible. And so what could be done in the future? Well, the number of approaches that are being considered, um, these two are the, the most promising in my, my opinion. Um, one is either growing sperm from stem cells um, in vitro and then doing in vitro fertilization down the road, or potentially restoring fertility where you take a testicular biopsy and then you transplant those cells back to the patient's uh, uh, testis. Now this pediatric testicular sperm stem cell extraction is a pretty simple procedure, it takes around 30 minutes or so. And most of the time we combine this with other procedures. And um, I'm really grateful to our fantastic pediatric urology team here, who is now really doing the, the lion's share of these procedures. Um, the testicular tissue is removed, it's cryopreserved. Um, the sample is saved for research to try to develop these techniques. And then uh, also a clinical sample is preserved. Now there are significant ethical considerations here, including you know, respecting family's wishes, doing good for patients, not hurting them, and also tissue ownership and consenting. So from an autonomy standpoint, really having respect for, in this case, the parents' um, preferences, um, how old is the child and their ability to really make decisions. And as the child gets older, including those children in, in this process, um, and also respecting parents' rights while the preserving this testicular tissue potentially allows these children all, all of their options for, from a fertility standpoint. So we're trying to do good by offering testicular tissue cryopreservation, but how realistic is it that this tissue we take today is going to help this three-year-old in 20 years actually achieve fatherhood? Is there really this reasonable expe expectation that this will work? So at this point, essentially our national recommendations, our national guidelines are that these sorts of testicular biopsies for pre children should be done really only in the context of an IRB approved uh, program. So what about hurting the patient? You know, some of these, some of these patients, if not, you know, a significant fraction for at least bone marrow transplant patients, 10 to 20% of these children will retain fertility. So how much harm is acceptable when we're taking these biopsies? 
Now, I've been I've been happy to to note that essentially the risks of these biopsies are small. You know, minor bruising and swelling. Um, I've I've not yet seen an infection yet, even when these children are exposed to chemotherapy just a few days later. Um, is there some additive diminished fertility problem or hypogonadism? Um, that's really difficult to disentangle, and and also this approach really has just not been around very long. Uh, Often the parents, fathers in particular, will ask me about cosmetic risk and that's we're taking a small biopsy, usually a five to 10% of the volume of one, one testis. So really importantly is, well, what do you do with this tissue in the event of the child's death? Now for adults, there are three options um, for a parents or for people to think about. They can either discard this tissue, they can use the, their, they can allow their spouse to use this tissue um, or it can be used for research. But in the case of children, um, that we only allow two options, either this tissue can be discarded or do research with the tissue and then discard. This idea of taking a three-year-old's tissue and what would the three-year-old want from a fatherhood standpoint? Where do you get the eggs? Who would carry this, this embryo and, and be a surrogate? So there are many, many ethical problems with allowing um, someone other than that child uh, to uh, make decisions about that. Um, so again, are we doing more harm than good? Um, you know, I, I think in general that the, the benefits probably outweigh the risks in, in these children. So the, the parents ask us about what can you do with it? Well, the, these two possibilities are, as I've listed here, either an autologous testicular cell transplantation. Um, this is a technique that's been around since the mid 1990s and has been done in many mammalian species from mice, rats, um, sheep, goats, dogs, um, and then most recently, as of about eight or nine years ago, have been done in rhesus macaque. And this particular technique offers the potential of natural conception afterward. A second major possibility is doing in vitro maturation of spermatogonia. Essentially, you dissect it. You take the testicular cells and utilize um, uh, a in vitro system to grow sperm. This technique, as you'll see in a few slides, has been successful in mice, but no other, no other animals. So Brian Herman, uh, now in San Antonio, and Kyle Orwig, who's at Pittsburgh, did this work at, in rhesus macaque, and they, they demonstrated that you could take an orchiectomy, you could take that, that testicular tissue, you could inject it into the ready testis of, of a monkey, and you could see the, the movement of, of dye, and under ultrasound, you could see the, the movement of optison retrograde within the seminiferous tubules. And uh, these subsequently, uh, these monkeys were, were biopsied after, after a number of months, and they found spermatogenesis. They found sperm in these, in these monkeys. So we, we strive to uh, essentially develop this kind of system that could be used for urologists and allow us to actually develop these skills. So over the course of many years, this has taken us about five years to do, and it's difficult to get a source of testis to actually practice this. And I was using uh, halal butcher shops to get sheep and goat testis. The testis were just not fresh enough to be able to use them. Tried to have success in prepubertal pigs. Thought we had a farmer in the Central Valley who could actually get us the, these pig testicles. We we're excited we could start doing these techniques. And then unfortunately, we got a call after lunch to, to uh, tell us that the, the farmer's dogs had eaten all the testicles. So that, that set back our research program for a, a little while. Eventually, we were able to get a supply of testis, um, kept practicing these techniques. Um, eventually, the Humane Society here in San Francisco and using dogs was our, really our best approach to really uh, refine this, this technique. And you can see the, the way that this approach looks um, in a, a paper that's just actually been accepted a couple of days ago, where we've been using now human testis after we'd worked out the kinks. Um, and you can see on this, this video, essentially you can take a needle and under ultrasound guidance, you can see retrograde flow of optison into the seminiferous tubules. And so this is a technique that is a straightforward one, essentially for a urologist to learn how to do. And what we wanted to do in this paper was essentially to demonstrate that cells that we were injecting matched up with what we saw on ultrasound. And so that's, that's what we saw is that we could see the, the flow of, of contrast sonographically, and we were able to see uh, within the lumen of seminiferous tubules on, on cross-section, we were able to see the, the presence of, of stained cells.
Well, what about the second approach? So this, well, again, I should say before moving on, that technique has actually never been done in, uh, that this injection technique has never been done in humans. And I think we're now uh, approaching the, the possibility of being able to do that. So from an in vitro maturation of spermatogonia standpoint, you start out with a really small amount of source material. Um, and what could be done? Well, uh, this, this paper by Sato back in 2011 published in Nature demonstrated you could take newborn mouse testicular tissue you could, utilizing a three-dimensional gel, you could grow sperm, isolate that, that sperm, and uh, do in vitro fertilization, essentially, in these mice, and have healthy um, mouse pups. Again, this has never been done in humans, but this is a really important technique because there are many situations, leukemia patients, for example, where the idea of injecting cells back into that patient would be a bad idea. A very small number of cells injected back into a patient, or at least in, in models with mice, can kill those mice. Um, transgender patients, for example, you know, you don't have the right hormonal milieu uh, to allow a transplant technique to work. Now, really where we are um, today, or I should say as of work that Dr. Orwig from Pittsburgh published was taking this model, taking testicular tissue out, taking those tissue fragments and then, and then transplanting them underneath the skin of either the back or the, the scrotum of these monkeys, and then waiting a while. And so with an intact pituitary, the, these monkeys ended up uh, gener develop, they, they essentially late cell function was restored. These monkeys had normal testosterone and they had normal FSH levels and uh, sperm production occurred in these, these little testis buds, essentially all, all over the transplant areas. Sperm was found, they were able to do in vitro fertilization and then had a healthy baby monkey. And this, this baby monkey's name is Grady up at the Oregon Primate Center. So this is really exciting because this sort of technique is straightforward. And to be able to take these, this testicular tissue, transplant it back under the skin of the scrotum for one of our patients, this is a straightforward kind of thing that we could, we could implement. So again, when you think about these, these challenges, um, you know, logistical challenges, refer patients early for, for freezing it requires a lot of coordination. I wonder how big of a biopsy to take. And this remains, I don't, I don't know how big of a biopsy to take. I know this, we, we don't yet have good culture techniques to be able to test these. And we need to develop ways to grow this, these stem cells to sperm and, de and develop these, these models. That remains an unanswered question. To be able to do this, you need to have a urologist, reproductive urologist, a stem cell biologist, and, and a team of people who can help work toward this. We're continuing to investigate this with our PD life study for children and our restore protocol to try to do these transplantation techniques. So again, to, to summarize, um, collaboration between us, clinical, uh, clinical services, um, the, the cryopreservation labs, oncology is really, really important. Um, banking tissue or sperm prior to therapy is, is really I, the ideal way to go. Doing the testicular biopsy is, is possible, but an IRB protocol, uh, you should do it under an IRB protocol and really having a detailed discussion with parents and uh, family members about what their preferences are is the best way to go. So again, these collaborations are, are, are key. So again, thank you very much for, for your time. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to answer any questions about uh, this, this work.